Okay, we are live. Oh, I can hear myself back for some reason. Um, oh, okay, awesome. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, so yeah, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Holy Humanist. Uh, we are here for part two of what we discussed last week in terms of the pagan origins of Islam in Southern Arabia. And as last week, and as promised, we have Lloyd de Young back with us. Uh, so again, a massive, massive, massive pleasure for us to have him here and share his knowledge with us. Um, and guys, basically, today, before we do get started, um, we just want to touch on a couple of things. So uh, I understand I do have mods on this channel, but even before I kind of go into that, so this channel, Holy Humanist, was, if you look in the About section of the channel, this channel is uh, solely dedicated to uh, looking at Islam and understanding it for what it actually is and the genuine threat it is, the oppressive system that it is for women and children, the way it glorifies war um, and those kind of things. So everything Islam and human rights related and everything that comes within the scope of that. Um, this, this channel does not promote any other religion and this channel also does not go out of its way to uh, bash any other religion. So if I have gone to the trouble to find a guest who so graciously is willing to kind of come onto this platform, even though Lloyd and I don't necessarily come from the same worldview, we both can see that there is a very fundamental threat that Islam brings with it and that manifests whenever Islam is in a place of dominance and power. So given Lloyd's background and given everything that he's kind of seen in his life um, and therefore his findings of Islam uh, from deep, deep in sources that you and I probably have never heard of and me as a lay ex-Muslim are joining forces to kind of uncover what damage Islam can possibly do. So we're like having said that, that that's the main topic and that's the, the purpose of these presentations and for Lloyd to so kindly share you know his thesis of, of of what's happening in southern Arabia and how that lent itself towards Islam for us so I'd really appreciate it guys and girls whoever's watching in the chat um, please make sure that the chat sticks to the topic at hand and nobody goes on to attacking anybody else's worldview um, other than the topic at hand here. So if Lloyd has so graciously decided to come on here, there is no point trying to send comments and saying, you know, things about Lloyd to look into Christianity and things like that. That is not what is being discussed here. So I'd really appreciate it. If you do see any of that funny business going on in the comments, please do nip it in the bud. Um, some people who are here who are my regulars, Ray, the producer as well, welcome. If you're here and you can be a mod for the duration of this, I'd really appreciate it. Zagros as well, uh, you're here. So if you guys could just help me keep an eye on the chat and make sure it's not stirred to hateful comments and taking away from the whole motive behind this presentation. Uh, but yeah, that's just a little disclaimer and a bit of insight into why we're doing what we're doing and the way we've teamed up like this and the fact that Lloyd understands what this channel is and has still uh, gone out of his way to come on and present this information. And I think we all need to respect that. Um, so yeah, Lloyd, would you do you have any comments on that? And before we start? I know, much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'm just really glad to be on the channel with you. I, I really enjoyed the first one. It was really stimulating discussion. And um, I mean, you're a really good host and a very sharp mind. So I look forward to the, the interaction on this one again. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so everybody, we're going to kind of go with the same kind of format as last week. So if you have any questions as we're talking about certain things, feel free to send them our way and we'll try and address them as we're on that slide or as Lloyd is in the middle of presenting that information. Uh, Ray, thank you so much. You're an absolute legend. I will make you a mod right now from my phone. Um, and hi, hi everyone. Um, I don't want us to get carried away, but thank you all so much for being here. Music guy, you're an amazing mod. If you could also keep an eye on the chat today, please. Let's keep the topic on hand, guys and girls, and let's keep it clean and let's keep it respectful and focus on literally tearing Islam apart um, bit by bit. So yeah, Lloyd, the floor is yours. And I'll just sort out my mods in the meantime. Right, so yeah, so thanks everyone for being here. And uh, for those of you who missed the last one, it would help to watch the first episode that gives us a good foundation into early Islamic history. Let me share my screen and then 
I can sure. just do a very quick overview of what we are going to be discussing. So we're looking at the very early history of Arabia. We're focusing on the south in Yemen and Ethiopia. Most of the focus is in Yemen with its ties to Islam. And also we're going to be looking at how these, these areas are connected to places like Babylon. Uh, because the entirety of Arabia, including places like Greece and Rome and so on, pagan Greece, pagan Rome, all shared a very similar, if not the same pantheon of gods, of pagan gods. Arabia was no different, and it shared that same pantheon with Babylon. And this is part of what I believe is the foundation of proto-Islam, and we've been looking through the evidence on that. So very briefly, we're going to be looking at archaeology, history, language, as well as the Islamic sources. Um, Christianity was a very early arrival in Arabia, much earlier than anticipated, so there's an influence with that. However, along with Christianity was Gnosticism and various heresies, which also play into uh, Islam because you can see the Christology or the, the concept of Christ within Islam, within the Quran, is very much heretical, very much Gnostic. Within Islamic law, the Sharia and the Fiqh explicitly states that Islam is a Gnostic religion. Uh, so. Proto-Islam is based on pagan moon god worship, and uh, the symbol of this pagan moon god was the crescent and star. You'll see one in every mosque these days. And we also are going to be discussing the Arabian pagan god called Maka. Right. So, yeah, so that's, I think that gives us just a brief update on that. Well, there'll be more, but let's continue where we left off last time. Anything awesome. you'd like to add before we go on? Uh, no, that's great. I just um, did you say today we're going to also cover where the Sharia implies that Islam has Gnostic foundations, uh, or is that later I can on? if you want. I can show you some of the some of the references within the Sharia. Certainly, I can do that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if it doesn't come up, it's okay. But I'd love to delve into that at some point for sure. Um, well, since I've said it, let's let's do that now then. So, okay, very short then. So, everyone, the Sharia is the will of Allah, the law of Allah, but also the law of Muhammad. We did cover some of the Sharia last week. We discussed that Sharia applies not only to Muslims, also to non-Muslims, and that the punishment for insulting Muhammad is death. I think we went through that in some detail. Yeah. We went through about five pages of the legal rulings on that. All of them explicitly said death. And if we'd continued for another 20 pages, we would have seen that theme repeated ad nauseum. Right. But I think we made our point. This book is the most common, the most popular, and the most available, the most read Islamic law manual in the world. This is from the Shafi'i school. However, the schools all share roughly 75 to 80 percent of their rulings are identical. The one-fifth or so where they differ, these are things that are not fundamental to the religion. They don't affect the, the doctrine. These are merely cosmetic Okay, this is called Reliance of the Traveler. So I said, this is the most popular Islamic law manual in the world. For instance, this is some of the, so have a look here. We've got marriage, 506. So there's like 50 pages on marriage, divorce. If you look at things like prayer, prayer, sorry, you'll see 120 pages of information on prayer, how to pray. Wow. You'll notice the Quran does not contain, for instance, the five daily prayers. Yeah. Nor does it teach you how to pray. Well, this book will teach you everything you wanted to know about prayer and were afraid to ask okay um let's go for instance let me think uh the prayer so let's go to i would love to read that chapter on on marriage and divorce actually oh, I no, think it's, I'll... it's interesting so let me just run ahead there's something i'll show you about prayer mm -hmm. um for instance isis people say isis is not islamic right that they're extremists well um i did cover that last week and i will try to touch on that since you've asked but they are they effectively, there's a range of permissible worship within Islam called Rukhsa and Azima. The differences between the four schools of fiqh that is encapsulated in a doctrine called Iqtilaf, just meaning mm -hmm. difference, right? And this was harmonized by a scholar called Ash-Sharani in his book, The Mizan al-Kubra, The Great Balance of the Supreme Scales. And there's a range of worship that is permissible within Islam. So you have this loose worship, right, called Rukhsa, and there's a very strict worship called Azima. Um, ISIS, for instance, is is strict. They are following Islam according to the doctrine of Azima. The only place that they differ from Orthodox Islam, where they break what's called the Ijama, the orthodoxy, is that they have abolished Rukhsa. That's really okay. the only thing that they have that they differ. Otherwise, their doctrine is standard Sunni Orthodox Islam. 
Right. But notice it states here. So notice ISIS would behead anyone who did not pray, who did not come and pray the prayers. This was common. There were apparently baskets of heads all over the place. Because it states here in the Islamic law, under strict Islam, so if the Sharia is implemented in full, if they take over and they implement the Sharia, a Muslim who holds the prayer to be obligatory, but through lack of concern, neglects to perform it until its proper time has not committed unbelief. Right? That's a relief. Yeah. Rather, he is executed, washed, prayed over, and buried in the cemetery. Wow. Okay. That changed very quickly. Very, very quickly. So this yeah, is, I so even, the, even in a state letter. now, like, uh, uh, like in Afghanistan, for example, this is what, yeah. this is the manual that they'd be operating with, right? As an Islamic state. Yeah, they are Deobandis, most likely, well, the bulk of them are Deobandis. So it's going to be very similar because of the Ijma. Okay. That's the consensus between the four schools. ISIS was killing people who missed a prayer. This was standard mm. practice. And this is why. Yeah. This is, uh, for instance, um, there's another reference I want to find. There's a lot of information on the prayer here. No, I wasn't planning to do this. Okay, so something called the Sutra. It is recommended to put a barrier at least 32 centimeters high in front of oneself when performing the Islamic prayer. Okay, fine. Let's have a look at what else it has to say. If someone tries to pass, someone tries to pass between oneself and the barrier, it is recommended to gently push him back. If he persists, if you are blocking the way, if you are praying, but your body is blocking a path, and someone tries to walk past, you may push him back as hard as necessary, as you would an attacker. If the person trying to go past were to die, you would not be subject to retaliation or have to pay indemnity to the kin. Oh, this is insane. I mean, this is the religion of peace for you. And I mean, I know this is like the in intense actual like basis behind it, but that's why when people do, like even in the West, for example, when they do just think that they can put up their prayer mat in the middle of the road or on a sidewalk and they do it with such conviction because it doesn't matter what the consequences are it, it's it's your prayer at that time and this is as you're saying like when you don't have that in, in barrier anyway a lot of muslims put something there to make this imaginary bar barrier so anybody that's walking past doesn't uh like disrupt your prayer but this concept of having a barrier and nothing come between it is so important yeah, so you can kill someone while praying and you have absolutely no guilt or fault assigned to you. Yeah, literally, no, not one would not be subject to retaliation or have to pay an indemnity to his kin. So if, if this person was to die as a result of your push, which is an intentional push with intent to keep your prayer going with this, and death in, like as happens as a result, you walk scot-free. Under under the Sharia. Now, look, obviously, you might do this today in London. You'll obviously go to jail. You might do so in exactly. uh, for argument's sake in an Islamic country. But that is only because Sharia is not yet fully implemented. Once yeah. it is, under the Taliban, under ISIS, this is what is legal. Agreed. This then becomes the law. Um, okay, under so, one, hello yeah. and welcome. Um, yeah, it's good to have you here. I'm excited for our chat tomorrow as well. Yeah, welcome, Thunderous. So let me have a quick look here. So looking within the manual, now this is one manual. Understand no single Islamic law manual contains everything. Often there are specialized manuals, one on marriage, one on prayer, one on fasting. They'll have a little bit of everything. The largest and most complete, to my knowledge, is the Hedaya in the Hanafi school of fiqh. This manual is special, though. This one has a little bit of everything. It is a single volume that compiles a little bit of everything. It has, it compares with other schools and it has the most sound rulings of those schools presented for you as a compendium. So there's, there's no other Sharia manual like this in the world that I know of. So I've looked up the word Gnos, G-N-O-S. We have Gnosis mentioned 18 times, Gnostic five times, Gnostics plural three times, and Gnostics with an apostrophe one time. So that's more than 20 references, almost 30 references. So for instance, if you're looking at Gnosis within Islam, he writes, the Sheikh al-Akbar writes, There's the spirit, there is the spiritual station of annihilation in Gnostic vision. In other words, there are multiple spiritual stations. So this is a part of a ritual series of incantations and exercises you do to free yourself from your physical mind and body and to enter into the throne room of Allah. 
So oh, okay. it's a series of occult magical practices so that you can have Gnostic vision. That's okay. So this is like um, Islam's version of like almost like transcendental meditation to get the union with God, if you will. They claim so. So the Islamic scholars claim that they have the true gnosis that everyone who came before was just uh, was just uh, lost or faking it or didn't find the truth. These guys have the true knowledge, the gnosis, and this is in the classical sense of what we know as the gnosis from the Gnostics. Okay. Right. So they speak of the harm of stopping at the first traces of gnosis. You have to push through, right? So others claim to have attained to gnosis and contemplative knowledge of the divine to have passed through spiritual stations and states and to have reached nearness to Allah. Others have, but we, we, those guys are faking it. We as, we as the Islamic scholars, we as the Muslims, we've really reached it. Our hearts are aflame with the love of Allah most high and we have attained to Gnosis. We found the true path. Okay. So the true knowledge, knowledge of the Gnostics, we have found it. So not Buddha, not anybody else, they found the real truth. Correct. Okay, this is a longer story, but uh, let me do a very short summary then. So Islam has four levels and two divisions. The two divisions are the Sharia, which is the law, which is to obey the law, right? It's illegal. That's really just a legal issue. Just do what you're told. Then the other side of it is called the Hakika, the knowledge, which is knowing the truth, mm -hmm. right? So you as a lay Muslim, you follow the Sharia. You do what you're told, but you're also at the bottom of the stack. Now, the other side, the Hakika, this is only open to the most highly knowledgeable, most highly spiritual of the Islamic Imams. Those Imams all happen to be the Sufis. So the highest level of development within Islam is specific and exclusive to the Sufis. Now, then you've got four levels of knowledge, right? And notice all the saints in Islam are all Sufis. Yeah, true. Right? When they speak of saints in Islam, they're all Sufis. So your lowest level of knowledge in Islam, the very lowest level, and don't forget, the Quran is at this level. So the Quran is the lowest level of knowledge. So what the Hadith at this level is called the, the, you have the Ibara, which is the lowest literal level. Then you have the Ishara, the level of the Imams. Then you have the Lata'if, and then you have the Aqa'ik. Right? So you have the four levels. So okay. the Ibara is where the lay Muslim is, where he simply just knows the literal meaning and he obeys. Then your Imams have what they call the allusions, what is implied, what is state, what is not necessarily stated. Then the Lata'if is the understanding of the hidden reality. Okay. Right? This is an understanding of the subtle truths. But you have to have you have to have these this training and this all transcendental meditation, as you say, to understand that. And the final level is the Aqa'ik. These last two levels are only open to the Sufis and to the saints. So they effectively become as, as, as gifted as the prophets. They become like the prophets and then they are open to the secrets of Allah. They then achieve the secret knowledge. So they speak of the Gnostic in his first states is affected by the impact, right? And they speak of the Gnostic's spiritual will exalted above all else because they are Gnostics. His spiritual will is exalted above all else, right? And then they speak here of someone who has reached the level of those to whom the unseen is exclosed, the ghaib is exclosed. And yeah, so the veil, Gnostic. they can see beyond that veil that most of us are right. not privy to. Right. Yes. The, the ghaib is mentioned 15 or 16 times in the Quran, and it refers to the, the occult, the unseen. Right. We have Gnostic insight. They have special knowledge. You enter through the door of Gnosis, which is the secret knowledge. Right. So they have what... They worship, okay, let me finish this since we're on the Sharia. So to worship in Islam, there are different levels of worship, right? But the minimum that is required. So it says here, the perfection of faith, which is called Ihsan. The perfection of faith is to adore Allah as if you see him. And if you see him not, he nevertheless sees you fine and well. That's the omniscience, okay? yeah. But now... So scholars mention that there are three spiritual stations a servant may have in his worship, okay? Mm -hmm. So one, you have to worship in a way that fulfills the obligations of Islam by observing it, all its conditions and integrals. These are legal conditions. These are rules, right? These are, okay. this is part of Actual the law. Rules. Yeah. Right? So one, you must also, and then secondly, to do this while immersed in the sea of Gnostic inspiration. The secret knowledge, the gnosis, the mukashafa, right? And then thirdly, 
to worship as mentioned above. Okay, though aware. Okay, well, let's just. Okay, then they mentioned to worship as mentioned above. The mainly way that the last sees one. Okay, so you eventually, eventually, you get into direct contact with Allah. This is a summary, right? All three of these are of the perfection of faith, ihsan, but the perfection required for the validity of worship is only the first. In other words, just follow the rules, do as you are told, obey. Yeah. Perfection in the latter senses is the mark of the elect and not possible for many. Wow. Okay. This so that's just confirming that many. hidden knowledge amongst the, the highest Sufi level. Correct. Okay, so Lloyd, a couple of things, because this is really fascinating for me as well, especially coming from, uh, uh, so just, just so I've understood this correctly. So people like me who were just once upon a time a normal, supposedly believing Muslim, right? Who was born into it and accepted it as the truth. I form part of the Ibarra, is that correct? So yeah. I am therefore allowed access to the Quran and the Sunnah, and some right? Hadith. And some Hadith, some right? Some Hadith. And the tafsir is only allowed to you in the company of, of a of an imam who will interpret it for you. Right, exactly. That's why the Muslim emphasis is always on like, well, we don't know. The scholars know. The imam knows. I, I can't. Literally, they are like, this is Have beyond my. <laughs> yeah. Have you no, consulted I... a scholar? Yeah, exactly. That, that's literally their go-to. But um, so that's really interesting because what? So from where I'm standing, I thought. And this is because I, I might be very ignorant in this, but I literally thought, for example, living in Saudi and seeing like Wahhabi Saud like Islam play out there. And there's a huge concept there where even the monarchy um is not above the ulema, right? The religious elite, the ruling scholars. Um, but then in my understanding, Sufism, like they they completely shun away from the idea of saints and like even saint worship or following the methods that the saints used. And so Sufism branched off entirely, but According to this like chain of command that you're saying almost, the, the top of those like scholarly circles are in fact Sufis essentially as like as like Freemasons of some kind or and yeah, they claim Gnostics. to be the, the Sufis do claim to be the original Freemasons and they claim to have founded Freemasonry in Europe. Oh, okay. Wow. So I, I need to look into like how Sufism still manifests itself then. So so are these scholars at the top then? Would it be right to say that they, they are heavily influenced by Sufism, but that just doesn't trickle down and we don't see it? Or Look, you need to understand Sharia is technically a secret. Okay. Okay. I have for two years now, more than two years, every single person who ever replies to me, who comments to me on my channel, any channel, whatever, I asked them, come with me live. Let us simply read through the Sharia together. We'll take a handful of fiqh manuals and we'll just read them. You know, we'll read on apostasy, on whether or not it's legal to uh, marry little girls or have sex with little children, you know, prepubescent yeah. sex. Let's read through the law. What do your imams say? What's in the ijma? What do, what do Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, what do they say? I have not had one person accept, not one, because it's illegal for a Muslim to talk about the Sharia would be to reveal a weakness and a secret of Islam, and it would be treason, and that is punishable by death. Wow, okay, yeah. And and just because you mentioned the word treason there as well, when I actually looked into the word for apostasy, or irtida in Arabic, is like actually akin to the word treason. So even the act of leaving Islam is like akin to treason, which just treason. really emphasized for me the, the political nature of Islam as opposed to it being like a religious, spiritualistic belief system True. that's very good actually i'm going to look up that word in a minute in the encyclopedia of islam but notice the word dawa right so what happens is because we're westerners we understand the world in a certain way we have certain definitions uh, hey thunderous welcome man. um so what happens is we see things through our perspective our western lens right however they have a completely different meaning of that word so the word dawa we think of it as evangelization it has nothing to do with evangelization it is a completely okay. different concept. Dawah is an entirely secular word. Yes, it can mean call. It can mean invitation. Let me show an example of Dawah. Hey, Thunderous, do you want to come over and have a beer tomorrow night and get drunk? I'm going to, I'm going to fry some, some steaks. Come on over. Let's, let's, let's you know, have a couple of beers and just get sloshed. What do you say, buddy? That's Dawah. That's a call. That's an invitation. That is not, that is not, an, that is not an evangelization. That's an, that's an entirely secular usage of the word. Right. Properly speaking, dawah means propaganda. 
and it means pretension, to pretend. Okay? Dawah is propaganda for a member of the Prophet's family and propaganda for the Imam. If you look yeah. at the, if you go into the Encyclopedia of Islam and you look up the usage of, of Dawah, it is propaganda. It is state propaganda. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we see. Okay, so do, the, do these Dawah, I mean, does the Dawah community would they know these trade secrets and understand exactly the root of the way that they are Probably using Dawa no. and the way they're selling it to Western minds? Probably not. No. Okay. No. Um, Mar so, Marcus here has uh, made a really good point just saying, so it's much like cults and secret societies. There are hidden tiers of understanding and they strictly gatekeep it. Yeah. And Gassim saying that was a great interpretation of Dawa. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So hopefully does that does answer your question. We can get back to the presentation. But yes, if you have questions, yes, thank please you. Are. No, 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 that that's fine. I just uh, as soon as you said it, I really had to kind of see for myself the link uh, to Gnosticism or even just the reference and mention of it within the Islamic Sharia or fiqh. So thank you for that. That that was very eye opening. Okay, so this is where I ended off last week. So I'm just gonna go back one slide just to cover, just to recap where we left off. Muslims like to say that the crescent and star symbol originated in Turkey in 1843, technically. However, let's go to Turkey here on the left-hand side to the first century and prior to the first century, and we'll see that the crescent and star was utilized by the pagans in that part of the world, the, the Babylonian pagans in that part of the world pre the first century. Yeah. So this has been in use for a long time. Here's other usages of it. This is a pagan Byzantine coin. This is not a. This is not when. This is not from the Roman um, Christian Byzantines. This is pagan Byzantine. So, Muslims argue that the popular symbol of Islam was made popular during the Ottoman Islamic Empire in the eight, mid 1800s. Others state it is the pre-Islamic pagan deity, a moon god. Right. Now, religious symbols are historically and theologically significant. So the cross is linked to the crucifixion of Christ. So it has a historical as well as a theological significance with, within Christianity. Thus, it's logical that the crescent moon should have a historical and theological meaning for Islam. True. So Islam claims to be the original true monotheistic religion of Abraham. And we're going to be looking into the religion of Abraham today. We'll be looking at the history, at least the, the narrative of Abraham from the Bible and so on. Okay. So associated with Abraham, we have the religion called the Hanif, right? Hanifan. So Hanif, plural, Hunafa. In Islamic writings, one who follows the original and true monotheistic religion. In the Quran, Hanif is used especially of Abraham. Later Islamic usage occasionally uses Hanif as the equivalent of Muslim. And Hanafiya is the religion of Abraham or Islam. Okay. okay, so they've already they're equated the religion of Abraham with Islam by using that use of that word. Yeah, yeah, we'll be talking about that. So that's we'll be focusing on that for a little while. So Hanif, right? Arabic. This is the Arabic word, the Hebrew word. So it's a Hebrew word. Now we realize, hold on, it actually comes from the Hebrew. It's an Arabic masculine name meaning righteous person, person or true believer. It is generally agreed that Hanif is derived from the Syriac word Hante, meaning heathen or pagan, also meaning mm -hmm. heretic. Right. <laughs> Zagros, that's a, really, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, uh, that cracked you me up. On the then. internet today. <laughs> <laughs> you did, Zagros. That was brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you won the internet. Um, someone asked if I would collaborate with some of the other guys. Um, I, I think that was you who asked if I would speak on other channels. I mean, I, I, if they reach out to me, I can certainly I, I consider it. Yeah, sure. I mean, if it, you know, if it's of value to them, then certainly. Um, but um, so, Muslims claim that Muhammad's religion goes back before Judaism and before Christianity, before the Christians and the Jews went astray, and before the laws of Moses. Though we had the seven laws of Noah. Now, the seven laws of Noah are the, are the basis for the Ten Commandments. Right. So five of the seven laws of Noah are word for word within the Ten Commandments, right? So half of the seven laws of Noah are in the Ten Commandments. Now, what's interesting is that as we go forward, we'll see that they actually make reference to the Hanifa, and they actually make reference to these laws of Noah, which they claim are not part of. So, and you'll see, so the, the Muslims clearly either deliberately or out of ignorance got this entirely wrong. But we're going to look at what is the original religion of Abraham and where all this went skew. So just briefly, Hanifa 
is usually translated in the in the um, in English translations as uprightness, to be upright. Okay, Hanifan does not mean uprightness. It means pagan, it means heathen. And the Christians and the Jews use it in the context of heretic. Okay. Right. So it meant it meant heathen, pagan, or heretic. Here is Quran 10105. Okay, this is Quran.com. And you'll see here, this is the term. And be steadfast in faith in all uprightness. And do not be one of the polytheists. Here's the term. It translates on Quran.com as upright. Okay. Let's have a listen here. So can you guys hear that? Uh, I can very, it's very low. Okay, though. no, so I'm not sharing. So I'm actually then, okay. So hold on, give me one second. Yeah, uh, sure. I'm going to play this for you because it's actually in the Quran. So I'm going to grab this and I will go there myself. Sure. Thomas Anderson is saying Abu Hanifa therefore equals Abu Upright. <laughs> Fair enough. That would be accurate. So let me uh, tell you what, let me stop sharing and then share with my video, with my audio. I'm going to share. Sure. Share screen, um, share system audio. Okay, there we go. I'm now sharing system audio. Hopefully you guys can hear right. this. This is Quran.com, 10105. And you'll see here that Allah is speaking that they need to be one of the Hanifan. Allah is Hanifan. 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 Okay. So understand yeah. Islam is Halif, Hanifan. Allah is, is Hanifan. All right. So... So now the, t the root, the triliteral root of Hanifan is HNF for pagan, right? So in the non-Islamic sources, we have the following. So the Jewish Midrashic literature, the root HNF is associated with heretics called the Menim. You'll okay. notice one of the very first names for Muslims was the Muqmanim. Actually, let me just uh, do this. So one of the very earliest names of Muslims was the Muqmanim. Right? Wow, okay, now, yeah. In, what is interesting is, sorry, my typing is really bad. Uh, here. Within the Jewish text, though, a heretic or a heathen was with a hafmanim in Islam, in Arabic. It's the mukmanim, right? Mukmanim just means believers, but we'll get into all of that as we go. So it's associated with heretics, and in the Syriac documents, hanpa or hanpe denotes non-Christian pagans. So in other words, these would have been somehow pseudo-biblical believers, but they were not properly orthodox, therefore they were heretics. Yeah. And it's interesting right. that the actual like Christians themselves considered them pagans and heretics. Yes. Yeah. They considered them pagan heretics. Right. So now the within the so the Christians and Jews said, look, you guys are Hanifan. They were calling these people Hanifan, pagans and heretics. Whereas the people they were directing at that, they said, Yes, we are. Okay, okay. they yes, just accept, they accepted it, yeah. Either they took it on or they didn't know what it meant. And they thought that we are following the right religion. So this is the name of that religion. They thought the Christians and the Jews were telling them the name of the religion, right? I that see. they are following. And they thought it was the correct religion before Judaism, before Christianity. So Christian apologists of the Abbasid period retained the pagan sense of the term and they, they applied it to the Muslims. They wanted to demonstrate the derogatory name, right? The meaning of the word by which Muslims called themselves. That's in the book Griffith, the Prophet. The pagan sense of the term was known to Muslim writers. They applied the title Hunafa to pagans such as the Sabiun. That's the Sabians from the north, right? In okay. Harania, the Sabians, known today as the Mandaeans, they are Gnostics. Remember, they hate Jesus. They revered John the Baptist, and their prophet is Enoch. Right? Okay. So, that's, uh, that's actually where I wanted to just allude to the Quranic reference and just check with you that, there be that these are the same ones being discussed because they are actually lumped in there with Jews and Christians. People of the book. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to pull that reference up real quick? Sure, by all means, if you want to go, go ahead, please. Okay, sure. Uh, just here, just to check. So, can you see this here? Uh, here we go. We can take. Sorry. Oh, you had it. Just, uh, there, yeah. There is, yeah. So indeed, those who have believed and those who were Jews and the Sabians and the Christians and the, how do you say that? Ma Magians? The Magians. 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 The, Magians. the Persians. Those, the Magians. Okay. And those who Zoroastrians. 
oh right okay so here they're talking about jews sabians christians and zoroastrians and those who are associated with allah allah will judge between them on the day of resurrection so here they're kind of casting them all off in my understanding there's two other references to them um but i didn't want to disrupt your presentation too much but that that's when you're talking about the people you're talking about now are that's the ones that are being referenced there do i have that correct yes okay um actually so let me go here search And it's the exact same uh, reference to them in the Hadith as well when they are referred to. So there's a little bit of confusion here within the Hadith. So since you brought it up, so. Mm -hmm. No, wrong reference. I wanted a different one. Get at this, Sabi. Ah, here we go. So let's go to Daif Bukhari, <laughs> Volume 1, Book 7, Hadith 340, right? Um, so notice. She asked where they said to Allah's messenger. She said, do you mean the man who was called the Sabi with a new religion? They replied, yes. So come along. They brought her to Muhammad, who was called a Sabi. Okay, so, so Muhammad. Two men met him and took me to the man who was called the Sabi. The Sabi. Very now, interesting. Now, the word means one who has deserted his old religion and embraced a new religion. The Sabis are a sect of the people of the scripture who recite the book of Psalms. Now, the Sabaeans, to my knowledge, will utilize the book of Psalms, but they are not Christians. They're heretics. They are Hanif. Yeah. Right. And also notice the Sabi. Now, the problem is that the term that is used here in the Arabic, I checked with someone who speaks Arabic, is Sabah, which you don't know whether they mean the Sabaeans or the Sabians. It's very okay. vague. But it states here that Muhammad is either a Gnostic Sabian or a Yemeni moon god worshipping Sabayan. Right. In this case, okay. it, looks like it looks like he's a Sabian here, which is a Gnostic. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, just, and, yeah. and so they they obviously we can we can associate this the scripture of the Psalms with them, right? You would Yeah. So okay. so they so under the category so they can choose to the yeah. Pick, yeah, so under, under the Quranic reference of people of the book, you could see how they could fall into that category. Yeah, because they were okay. loosely sort of vaguely Christian. But don't forget, Gnosticism is pseudo, pseudo biblical. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. So, um, although it is, although Gnosticism is um, very much derogatory towards Jews and also very much anti Christian. So mm -hmm. they are, they are they're definitely not on the same page. Now, the pagan sense of the term was known to Muslim writers and Yakubi describes as Hanifs the pagans who worship the stars in Saul and David's times. So pagan moon worshippers are recognized by even Muslims as being Hanifs, which is the same context that the Christians and the Jews were using it in and directing yeah. it at the Muslim. Yeah, exactly. So it does. It's, it really does seem like then they either, as you said, didn't know or they accepted it and said, yes, we are. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. So they thought, yeah, that that if the shoe fits. Now, Hanif yeah. is used of Abraham as pure worship of Allah, contrasted with idolaters known as the Mushrikun. Okay, it asserts that Abraham was neither Jew nor Christian, so they reject both of those religions, and that the people of the book were originally commanded to worship God as Hunafa. And you saw in Quran ten one of five, Hanifa, right? You heard, right? yeah, not as idolaters or polytheists. So this is something that is within the Quran itself, spoken by Allah. Now, the people of the book, the Al Al Kitab, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, later the Sabaeans. Now, the question is do they mean the Sabians or the Sabaeans? That's the million <laughs> that's dollar the question. Here. Yeah. And the Zoroastrians, the Omegians. And even in India, the idolaters there were at some point included. Wow. Right. Now, Abraham is not a Jew nor yet a Christian. In Quran 3 67, he was true in faith and he bowed his world to Allah's, which is Islam. Okay. So, not Jew, not Christian. But he was a Hanif, right? So they say, become Jews or Christians if you would be guided to salvation. But say thou, nay, I follow the religion of Abraham. Okay, so let's have a look at this. We need to start looking at what is this religion of Abraham. So yeah. Hanafia is contrasted with polytheism and the corrupted monotheism of Jews and Christians. So Moses claim was that Abraham was righteous before Judaism was founded. 
Correct, yeah. Now, evidence does, we, we do have plenty of evidence to show that for a time, the term Hanafiya was the name for Muhammad's religion. Okay. Now, oddly enough, so first there was a Hanafiya, right? So first you had the Hanafiya, then they became the Mokmanin. Then there were the Muhajirun. Only much later did they become Muslims, and only much later did the term Islam become common. Prior to that, these were the names they used. Okay. Both of these, Hanafiya and Mukminin, effectively mean pagans and heretics. Yeah. And then Muhajirun means like immigrant, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So Abraham was a Hanif Muslim. So technical use of Muslim and Islam started at the end of 2 AH. Okay. I think it's the second century AH. Okay. Um, so it's a, so those are so Muslim and Islam are generally very late terms within Islam. Right. Yeah. So yeah, True. just my little sense of you know, <laughs> Hanaf here. So so moving on. So the word Hanif in Islamic literature. So Ibn Isham uses Hanif as equivalent of Muslim. Right? So Muslim today was a Hanif then. A Hanif then was, as we will see, a pagan moon worshipper. Okay. So the more frequent is the use of Hanafiya for the religion of Abraham. Okay, fine and well. And you have Tahannuf, which means the adoption of Islam. And Tahannuf is a derivative word meaning penance. Oh, okay. right. Okay. So let's see in the Sira. The, the Sira is the Gospels of Muhammad. It's like the equivalent of the, the New Testament. They call it the biographies. It's really his Gospels. Yeah. Let's have a quick look. Salman the Persian told the apostle <clears throat> that his master in Amuria told him to go to a place in Syria. There was a man who lived between two thickets. And the sick used to stand in his way, and everyone he prayed for was healed. So this is a Christian monk who would heal people, do miracles. The people came to him with their sick, and everyone he prayed for was healed. And then he asked me who I was, blah, blah, blah. And I said, God have mercy on you. Tell me about the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham. And he replied, you were asking about something men do not inquire of today. Because that religion was starting to fade. The, yeah, long the gone time has come near when a prophet will be sent with this religion from the people of the Haram. Go to him, for he will bring you to it. Then he went into the thicket. The apostle said to Salman, if you, help, if you have told me truth, you have just met Jesus, the son of Mary. So apparently now, you know, in the earliest biographies, Jesus tells this guy, hey, there's this, this guy coming with this religion. You need to follow him. Yeah, so and, this is good. and he's, he's yeah. going to come from the people of the Haram. Yeah, now understand that harams go back into Yemen already, where they yep. were worshipping at those temples. That's the temple of like the Mahram oh. Bilkis. Yes. Right? And Which Al, al Makkah, right? Of, as well. Yeah. Sorry? Al Makkah, as well, as you discussed last week, right? Correct. Yes. Right. So let's have a look at further. So, four men who broke with polytheism, again from the earliest of the biographies. Okay. So, Abaydullah, so, so he said, find yourselves a religion for you have none. So they went there several ways in the land, seeking the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham. Waraka attached himself to Christianity and studied the scriptures until he had thoroughly mastered them. Ubaidullah went searching till Islam came. Then he migrated to Abyssinia. Okay. And when he arrived there, he adopted Christianity and died a Christian in Abyssinia. Fantastic. Zaid had determined to leave Mecca to travel about in search of the Hanafiya, the religion of Abraham. So they were searching for this religion. Okay. Then he went forth searching, searching for the religion of Abraham. And this man, it is alleged, was well instructed in Christianity. This is in Syria. And he asked him about the Hanafiya. And he said, you are seeking a religion of, to which no one today can guide you. Blah, blah. Same story as before. Okay. Now, Zaid had sampled Judaism and Christianity and was not satisfied with either of them. So a Christian is telling him, it's not Christianity. It's not Judaism. It's another religion. So this Christian doesn't know what this religion is. Okay. Fine and well. Now, before I go further, I'm just going to sort of generally, there's a lot of polemics within the Quran. It's a very polemical text. So let's have a look at how they will use words, confuse words, and alter words to suit them. Right? right. So you have Abram, the Ivri. So this comes from the Hebrew word, the Ivrit. In Islam, the same word is Ifrit. You have Ivrit, Ifrit. Right? Abram, the Ivri, okay, known, in, known as Ivrit, which means the Hebrew, also means to cross over or from the other side or a descendant, but it means to cross over the river is generally the accepted term because Abraham crossed the river. Abraham received news that his cousin Lot had been taken away as a prisoner of war. Fugitive brought news to Abraham the Hebrew. So in the New Test in the Old Testament, he's known as Abraham the Hebrew, Abraham Ha'ivri. Only later on does he become Abraham, right? Right. So in Genesis 13, 14, and so on. Now, biblical scholars 
Nahum Sadna concludes that Hebrew was an ethnic designation, right? So by the time of King David, the term Hebrew had largely disappeared, and for most of recorded history, the descendants of Abraham Hebrew were known as Jews. Fine and well. Now the term Chthonian, of all relating to the deities, the spirits, and beings dwelling under the earth. In Greek mythology, Chthonian refers to beings that inhabit the underworld. Okay? okay. Cthulhu, right? If you think of Cthulhu, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the demons that live under the ground, right? So if you look at the horror stories of H.P. Lovecraft, you have Cthulhu, Chthonian, right? Oh, okay. So let's That's have a look at what from. they've done. Sorry? That's where it derives from. Very interesting. Right. Now, Ifrit, okay, is an epithet expressing power, cunning, and insubordination. Now, who do you think have power are cunning and are insubordinate to God? Well, the Jews, right? According to Islamic doctrine, this is the case. Yeah. And this occurs only once in the Quran in the sense of the rebellious. It's a class of particularly powerful Chthonian forces, demons who live under the ground. Formidable and cunning. In the popular tales, the Ifrit is a jinn of enormous size, formed basically of smoke. It has wings, horns, ruins, and lives under the ground. It's a demon. So they've taken the description of the Jews and they've demonized them quite literally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very, very much literally demonize them. Right. So so the Jews are demonized within Islamic with well, within the Islamic vocabulary. So because they tend to twist words, but we'll we'll speak more about that. Now I'm gonna deviate again just briefly and talk about how scriptures and how ideas are twisted and utilized by people who are who are anti that particular idea. So let's look at John 844. So Abraham wasn't a Christian or a Jew. Now, this ties to early history within Christianity fighting against the Gnostics, right? right. So the Gnostics hate the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. Islam, Islam, you're required. So, so Muslims are required to bring the end times. Muslims must murder all of the Jews. They have to kill all the Jews, and then the end times will come. So, so it is, this is the law. This is Islamic doctrine. Yeah. Right? And and even stones and things will help them help the Muslims uh, be able to trace where the Jews are, except for one tree, which is on the side of the Jews. <laughs> yes, the tree Gartad, which is the yes. box thorn. Which yes, will... that one will conceal the Jews from the Muslims. All right. Yeah, so, I, so secular rarities came on. Thank you. Um, so... Now let's have a look at how these, so how the Bible has been twisted. This is an example, and then hopefully we can tie this back to you can get an understanding of where some of these influences come into Islam. So, for instance, Islam, there's a hatred of the Jews, and yeah. within within the Gnosticism, right, the various strands of Gnosticism, there's the very same thing. The source of that hatred is John eight forty four in the New Testament. The verse is, "You are of your father, the devil." And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and a puppet not in the truth. Now, this is the original. So so Jesus is here. And look, th this is not the opportunity to get stuck into a uh, he said, she said on the meaning of this verse, right? Mm -hmm. But sure. the accepted, you know, um, yeah. Anyway, so Jesus was talking specifically to the Pharisees. Now, you'll get people who hate Jews, hate Christianity, hate the Bible. They'll say, well, Jesus was talking to all the Jews. Jesus was himself a Jew. His apostles were Jews and, you know, but fine. So Jesus is now talking specifically to this, these group of Pharisees, possibly the, the leaders, if I recall. Okay. And he's saying, you are of your father. You are following your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. So he's speaking to that group. What happens is that the Gnostics come along and they reinterpret, just like Islam reinterprets everything, right? Yeah. So before Islam, you had the pseudo-biblical Gnostics who also reinterpreted the Bible. So John 8.44 is the source of their hostility to Jews and Christianity, claiming it is a pro-Gnostic verse. So the Gnostics have claimed throughout history this is a pro-Gnosticism verse, with Jesus affirming that the Jews serve the Gnostic Satan called Ialdabaoth. Right. Okay. So those who are anti-Semites make the same claims while generally ignorant of its historical source. Mm -hmm. So they seek to undermine the passage and legitimize their stance, the hatred of the Jews, just as Islam does without understanding the original source of it. OK, by asking if John 844 reads, you are of your father, the devil, or does it state you are of the father of the devil? OK, so they serve the father of the devil. Right. OK. Right? Yeah, as opposed so, to, yeah, you are of your father, the devil, or you are of the father of the devil, right? I see. So who do the Semantics, Jews serve? The Jews yeah. serve Yahweh. This would mean the father of the devil is Yahweh, meaning Yahweh is Satan. 
Yeah. You understand that okay. the God of the Bible, wow. the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, according to this interpretation, is Satan. Mm. And the Jews serve the father of the devil, who is Yahweh. So then by that token, Yahweh must be Satan. And therefore, they can make up a new God, the monad. And in fact, in Islam, Allah conforms almost identically to the monad, to the Gnostic monad. You'll find oh, right. there, are certain, there are certain overlaps, but that's for another time to go into that. Now, modern scholars do persist in this very same semantic game. Mm. Okay. So this is where that originally comes from. Okay. So the hatred so of the Jews is just derived to from clarify that in that pro Gnostic uh, interpretation, they are basically making Yahweh akin to the devil, pretty much, right? Satan. Yeah, yeah, he's the father Satan. of Satan. Yeah. He's a greater evil than Satan. Yeah. Okay, that's huge. Um, Lloyd, sorry, just before we carry on, um, I'll just address this quick super chat. To be love, thank you so much. Ray, this one is for you. Um, this is for producer Ray, my favorite guy and hero, most funny Trump impersonator. Cheers. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, To Be Love. Uh, Ray, that one is for you. Your ex-Muslim rap has taken off. And yeah, um, I wish, To Be Love, if you understand Urdu, you should check out Ray's stuff in Urdu because he is just as funny and the impersonations are hilarious of like Bollywood actors and stuff. So Ray is very multi-talented. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here, Ray. And thank you to be love. Stop Scamming Man is here as well. Thank you so much, Stop Scamming Man. Uh, Stop Scamming Man says, you can read translations of numerous Gnostic texts in Bart Ehrman's Lost Scriptures, published by Oxford. A good book on Zoroastrianism is Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrians in their, sorry, Zoroastrians, their beliefs and practices by Mary Boyce. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you, Stop Scamming Man. I will definitely look into... Uh, the Zoroastrian book as well, because I'm ge genuinely like interested in that and everything that Lloyd is alluding to today when they're, they are mentioned and I know how like ancient their practices are as well. Um, so I'll actually put this in the description as well, these two recommendations. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. Okay, yeah, so, so hopefully you have an idea now. So using this revisionist framework, Jesus is not a Jew. Yeah. Right? And the God of the Old Testament of Abraham and Moses, that we call Yahweh, is now Satan. In fact, the father of Satan. So he's a greater evil, right? Yeah. So this is the original source. This is entirely a Gnostic source because the Gnostics were trying to push their view of reality and obviously displace Christianity. So obviously Islam derives its belief from that Gnostic view. Obviously, it's taken from many views, but let's continue. Let's sure. look at Maimonides. He is considered the greatest sage within within well judaism right or one of its top two or three greatest um sages right so he speaks of abraham the sabaean so it is well known he writes that the patriarch abraham was brought up in the religion and opinion of the sabaeans remember the sabaeans are the yemenis yeah. right the yemenis worship the moon god al makka right the moon god makka right the moon god makka was thank you very much trevor thank you and so thank you, Mariam, as Makkah well. Thank was you, also guys. Known, Mariam, thank you. Appreciate it. So the moon god Makka was also known as the Babylonian prime moon god Shin, or Sin, as we say, S-I-N, mm -hmm. right? So now the thing is the Sabaeans are down south in Yemen. Let's have a quick look at a map. So notice the Sabaeans are down here in Yemen, okay? Abraham was up here in Turkey, in Haran, mm -hmm. right? And you've got Mesopotamia here. You've got, this is Mesopotamia. Here's, here's Syria, and then here's Turkey, southern Turkey. So understand, now how does Abraham have the very same beliefs and the follow the same God as this group down here? Well, obviously, they had the same beliefs all across Arabia. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and, and exactly. with various names, right? But essentially the same the same worship and practice, but the, the names, as you can see, are like the same pantheon exists across the board as well in Arabia, but there are slight variations. Um, also, just to follow up on this, Marcus was saying, right, we also saw the moon symbolism from the Kaaba in North Yemen. So, uh, <laughs> Farish Ahmed, thank you. If you're already subbed, we will also recognize that. Don't you worry. I <laughs> well, appreciate it. I appreciate the support, guys. Thank you. Um, so remember, we did discuss in the first episode that these Yemeni Sabians, right, their religion, according to this 9th or 10th century Islamic scholar, this historian, says that the modern Islamic practices we have today are effectively identical to the practices of those Sabaean Babylonian pagans. We discussed that. So 
So we've already discussed that. That so so in other words, you've got the very same religion in practice today, just called Islam rather than called this. You know. Thank you. So you're, what you're saying so, pretty much is you could literally just take the word savior in the way and put Islam there, and you'll pretty much get a mirror reflection much, uh, of current Islam. Islam, yeah. I mean, that's what that scholar said, mm -hmm. and that was in the ninth century, tenth century. You were saying that, wow. right? So. So the patriarch Abraham was brought up in the religion of the Sabaeans. That would be the Yemeni Sabaeans, those moon worshippers. Ignoble remnants of the nations left in remote corners of the earth, like the savage Turks in the extreme north and the Indians in the extreme south. These are remnants of Sabaeans who once filled the earth, the pagans who once filled the earth. Um, so let's continue. In their writings, Noah was rebuked and imprisoned because he worshipped God and with many other accounts about him. The Sabaeans contend that Seth, differed from his father adam as regards the worship of the moon okay so there's a divergence there between father and son apparently That's... and most of the most of the gnostics before before the advent of christianity when gnosticism took on a very christian sort of a flavor or cover mm. or facade they were all sethian gnostics you'll find that most of them are derived from the book of enoch enoch is the son of seth right okay Okay, and is that why they could have that that that's already like if there's a divergence there between, um, uh, what like for example, so Seth differed from Adam, and Seth, then like the Book of Enoch comes into play, and they're all brand they are basically branded Gnostics. Then would you say Islam is still following that trajectory, or is there some mix up from? What they contend so, Adam still believes this, in. This, this, look, it's really hard to tell. I mean, it's it's hard to tell. All we can do is look at the evidence and try to construct a conclusion. Mm. You know? So it would seem there's this pagan foundation, and then it changes through time as it goes to different geographies. It starts to add different ideas. For instance, if I go to the very earliest, now the, the in theory, the very earliest Gnostic within the Christian era would be Simon Magus or Simon Magus. Okay. Right. That's within the New Testament. You got Simon Magus. Then after that, the very earliest. Um, man, I would have to go and bring up a different presentation again. But the okay, very, no, very earliest. Yeah, I'm not going to go there right now. Mm -hmm. But just briefly, since it, I mean, it's an interesting conversation. I don't mind if you don't mind. I don't mind deviating and having the conversation. You know? Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, no, the Book of Enoch has long been considered um, Farish. The Book of Enoch has long been considered um, non-canonical. It's um, deuterocanonical. In other words, secondary canon. It's it's considered, yeah, it's, it's never been regarded as primary canon except within the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhiddo Church, which is where the term Tawhid in Islam comes from. So the, and many of the practices, as we discussed last week, of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church were taken into Islam, maybe modified, but the same concepts are there, the Christology to some degree, the very Jewish Christology is there as well. And they still revere the Book of Enoch. They still follow that. So unfortunately, I think that influence also impacted whoever Muhammad was, that that impacted him as well. And he's, you can see the influence in the beliefs. So the earliest that I can find of the Gnostic sects are called the al the and they had a book. So these guys are late first century, very early second century. So the late 90s of the first century, they had the book of al -Jasai. And for instance, the, many there are many, many parallels within the book of al within Islamic beliefs, Islamic hadiths. But also, for instance, they are the first religion to state Remember within Islam that you can use, you can you can dissemble. You can say, no, I'm not a Muslim. You can use taqiyya. Now, the book of al Chasai explicitly has the very same ruling as in Islam, that you can lie about your religion. Okay. It's stated explicitly. Um, yeah. And then, so, and then Lloyd, really quickly as well, just to just move on to Judaism for a second, because the Quran directly says that the Jews have taken Ezra as God. So do you know do, do you know where that because that that's another deviation or are they referring to another set of Gnostics within Judaism then when they're discussing that Very just probable, really quickly if you can. Jews okay uh, look yeah th that 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 question's been going around in circles for a long time it, it's either either they misunderstood which seems to be very common or or there was a heretical sect of Jews okay in that vicinity yeah. that they obviously thought was speaking for the majority of Jews. Yeah, Orthodox correct. Jews. Because right. it looks like that the, that particular ideas of theirs often were very, very regional. Okay. So. Yeah. Exactly. And and that's where you're saying, like, obviously, as as 
like the ver geographical variations change, that same form of paganism gets like a couple of layers here and there added to it, and it kind of starts taking a shape of its own. Yeah, it clearly changed over time. Um... <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, just yeah, right. <laughs> the, the, Ray, thank you okay, so much for your so... super. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, it's hopelessly archaic. That's such <laughs> such a good use of English. <laughs> yeah, right. Hopelessly archaic. It is indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray, for your super chat. Uh, okay, Ray says yeah. this is for Tubi's love, and I'm feeling the love. Congrats, Nuria Khan, for the wicked scoop. Islam is hopelessly archaic, and I'm so glad for this. As am I, Ray. Thank you so much. And all credit goes to Lloyd for dismantling it in this way. I'm learning so much. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> No, thank you. I also appreciate the questions. The, the questions also help to, um, you know, flesh it out and make it interactive. Um, okay, just on that point, Hassan, takia is one of many, many doctrines of lying within Islam. You must understand, takia is a very minor part of the doctrine of lying within Islam. There are two kinds of takia, right? There's takia where you deny your religion for your safety, which they will appeal to because obviously they're saying, well, you, if you don't want to die, you would do this. And fine, that is perfectly understandable. It's a, it's a choice of the lesser of two evils. But there's a second version of takia, a second definition of takia, which means tactical deception for the purposes of spreading Islam. That's a very different application of takia. But understand, takia is one of many, many different doctrines of lying and deception within Islam. The major doctrine of lying within Islam is called hiyal, H-I-Y-A-L. A L. Okay. So this is a very long, very lengthy discussion. It would take me two hours just to go through the doctrine of lying within Islam. That's a discussion on its own, just to show you the different kinds of lying. Understand Islam, we again in the West, we use the term morality, right? Islam does not have the concept of morality that is lawful and unlawful. We have right and wrong, they have lawful and unlawful. And understand that what is unlawful can be made lawful. There is nothing that is unlawful in Islam that cannot be made lawful given the conditions. Okay. And so they have, as I said, it's it's either legal or illegal. There's no right and wrong. And they are so lying in Islam is not only legal, it is mandatory, it is obligatory. And I, I know this might come as I mean, this this might seem very strong statement, but lying in Islam under Islamic law is not only legal, it is mandatory. Especially, particularly for ex its expansionist agenda. Is that correct? For many, many reasons. For Yes, that's one of them. One of them. This mm. is many, many reasons. There's a huge number of reasons. But the, and, Thank you, um, Lloyd. Um, yeah. uh, Farish was also saying, thank you, Lloyd, for the Enoch explanation. It bugged me for years. And um, Marcus is saying, Lloyd has been a real gift. Ray is saying, Lloyd, you're crushing it. Um, and... Marcus is agreeing with you here, saying, correct, fundamentally, Islam rejects morality. It's a code you follow or you are an enemy. And Ray, just finishing off on the Takia point, is like the kid with his hand caught in the cookie jar. <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry, continue. Um, no, it's sorry. fine. It's, it's, yeah, go anyway, ahead. If go you ahead want to say anything, continue. you want to add anything, please, by all means. Uh, no, that's fine. I was just keeping an eye on the chat as well and making yeah. sure. So look, I know I've made some very strong statements, but I would mm -hmm. have to bring out the, the Sharia again. I'd have to bring out the Fiqh and I have to bring out the doctrine on this. So, okay. and then we'd have to go through it. And well, stop Takiyah scanning, man. Is not Thank limited you. To yeah. Shia Islam. Um, Takia is not limited to Shia Islam. In fact, if you read the, the Sunni tafsir, the scholars call it Takia as well. Technically, Takia is technically a Shia practice. The name technically is Shia, right? For Sunni Islam, they have a name for it as well, called Mudarat. So the Sunni name is Mudarat. If you look up Mudarat, you'll find very little reference to it because the Sunnis just use the term Takiyah because it's the one that they all know. And yes, it mandates lying for every reason you can think of and some you haven't. Okay, You can lie whole day, every day, for free. It is not just... It, yes, it began as a defense against persecution by Sunnis. However, it has far far wider application than that. I've got a show on my channel. I've got several, two or three on that. There's a couple that are, there's a very short one. There's a middle length one, about an hour. There's one about eight minutes, one about an hour. And there's one like two, two and two, two and a half hours. It goes, it'll, it'll tell you everything you want to know about lying in Islam, but we're afraid to ask. 
And I think the source, um, stop saying, man, if you'd like the source, I, I'm, I'm sure Lloyd in that video you're talking about, you've got the source for it as well, right? What you're talking about? Um, yeah, there's plenty. As I said, I've got the videos, but uh, let me see. Uh, oh, it's one on here. Uh, yeah. Oh, find... Also, sorry, just Lloyd, while you're doing that as well, I was trying to write it down as well. Zagros, I'll get that. Sorry, can you just repeat the word for Dakia, the Sunni version, just so we can all go and have a read? Uh, <clears throat> technically, like, Mudarat. Mudarat, okay. It could mudarat. be this, Mudarat. Technically, it's called Mudarat. You'll find very little, little reference to it. What you will find is they all just use Takiya, even the, the Sunni scholars use it as well. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, that's just... what I imagine. So, Zagros, you might not find many references with that word, as uh, Lloyd is saying. Um, but so I think that's just... because Sunni scholars have jumped on the bandwagon of using that word as well. Claudius. Uh, uh... They certainly have. So let me see. I'm trying to find the reference within. Sure, no um... worries. Um, Claudius, thanks for your super chat. Claudius is saying it's not lying. It's, it is an alternative truth. Um, P746. Okay, so what happens is, in Islam, if you lie for the purposes of defending Islam, it's not considered a lie. It's it's not considered a lie. So it's very much um, legal. So I'm just going to give you a lawful. brief overview since we are talking about this. Sure. Okay. So this is, yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me go here. This is in the Sharia. Okay. This is the Fiqh. Notice it says here a chapter on lying. Section R 8.0. Then there is permissible lying. Then there's lying, which is allowed between husband and wife, or when a husband is allowed to lie to his wife. Why? Because Muhammad lied to his wife, right? Then you've got in lying to circumvent those forbidding the permissible. Islam is permissible. Forbidding it, trying to stop Islam from spreading is not permissible. Therefore, you must lie to stop those who are forbidding the per permissible. That's me. That's you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then so you any any they, situation that's against your uh, sorry is ag is against your interest, lying is lawful essentially and required, obligatory almost. Obli oh no, yeah, it gets this is yeah. this is a summary. This is a very oh. short notice. Notice what it says here under section R eight point two. It says obligatory lying. Oh. <laughs> obligatory lying. Obligatory lying. Okay. And Have then you ever seen see those here. two words together, Lloyd? I've not. <laughs> Only in yeah. Islam. And then if you are not keen to lie outright or you feel too embarrassed to lie outright, you are then recommended to, because it is religiously precautionary, to give a misleading impression, to use an alternative to outright lying, to mislead with deceptive words, which is, as we know, lying. And as we know, it's it's very much on brand because even Allah is the, the best of the deceivers in the Quran. Yeah, yeah Allah is a makkar. He's a liar. Yeah. So so someone asked, what is that book? Is there a book titled Sharia? Um, no, Sharia is the Islamic law. Sharia technically is, for, forget all the definitions you'll find online. The Sharia is the will of Allah. Okay, it's what Allah wants. So the, the Quran is appointed to the will of Allah. So all of that had to be exegeted. And the scholars had to formally make an orthodoxy for Islam. And so the scholars had to take all that. And it took about 300 years, 400 years to eventually write. The Sharia is the Talmud of Islam. right? Just like the Jews have a Talmud, which has exegeted the Torah. right? The Torah are the five books of Moses. So you've got this Talmud, which is 12 million words, which has exegeted five chapters of the Bible. Now you've got the Sharia, which has exegeted the Quran and the Hadith. And you've got this massive, massive corpus of work, which explains everything in Islam without the, without the confusion, without the deception. Right? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Lloyd. Um, real quick as well, to be love. Thank you so much again. This rates for you again. Uh, he subscribed and tries to watch all your videos. Sorry, I don't understand Urdu, but I'm a big fan. You, Ray is an amazing, amazing uh, activist who's recently come out on the scene and just really, really helping to change the game on both scenes. So thank you, Tubi. Um, and just this, yeah, 
wholly lying, exactly. And as Garcim is saying, and Lloyd is pointing out, in favor of Islam, any sin will be virtue, is basically yeah. the essence. Yeah, totally. Uh, Lloyd, just yeah. a quick question for you, sorry. Um, have you got a video on Mecca not existing in the Hijaz before Islam was made up? I'd look, check out Fanda Films, Jay Smith, his channel. Check out um, Sneakers Corner, Mal, who's now on Rumble called Origins. Um, unfortunately, this is not an area that I've specialized in. I do touch on this within this presentation. I mean, we're meandering right now, but I do touch on this. Certainly, I do touch on this. So it is a, it is a topic I will come to within this presentation. Maybe not today because we, we're jumping around a little bit, but yeah, we are. I will touch on it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Devil's Advocate, the Lloyd's channel is in the description of this video. So do go ahead and check it out. But it is Lloyd's full name, Lloyd D. Young on YouTube. Uh, but somebody will definitely pass you the link to his channel. Oh, Ray's just done it. There we go. Yeah, please go ahead and subscribe. He's doing amazing work. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would answer. Um, yeah, look, I'm going to I'm going to skip over something in the chat. Uh, I'm not keen to get into a uh, bun fight right now, which I would win. But so moving forward, okay. So yeah, any questions, Nuria, before I continue? Uh, no, I'm literally, this is all new information for me. So go ahead, hit us with more. <laughs> yeah, no, so look, I know I've made very strong statements, but I can certainly provide an entire, I mean, I could do an entire episode just showing the evidence for that. I could drown you in references, drown you in information, right? It's just that, um, but yeah, I, okay, so moving on. So Maimonides calls Abraham the pillar of the world. He became convinced that he's a spiritual divine being, which is not a body nor a force residing in a body. So something beyond the realm of matter. Okay. Right. But he was called the pillar of the world, which is very interesting. This, this pillar idea that Abraham was a pillar. And there's a book. There's a the great book on this subject is on the Nabataean agriculture translated by Ibn Washia. And I shall explain why the Sabaeans had their religious doctrines in a work on agriculture. The book is full of the absurdities of idolatrous people. And with those things to which the minds of the multitude easily turn and adhere, it speaks of talismans, the means of directing the influence of the stars, of witchcraft, of spirits and demons that dwell in the wilderness. Now, um, I do cover this later on, but understand within Islam, remember I've mentioned you have the star and the sun, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the moon and the sun. The moon is the moon god, the male, and then the star is his wife. And then the, the sun is his wife. Sorry, my bad. The moon is the man. The sun is the woman. They're married. They have kids. The kids are the stars. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the Sabaean belief that the stars are like a secondary part of the pantheon. Within its author, within Orthodox Islamic belief, the stars, the stars, are alive. The stars are higher beings that have souls. This is Orthodox Islamic belief. Well, we'll get to that. Understand? And then you've yeah. got demons that dwell in the wilderness, the jinn. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, uh, Lloyd, as you were reading that last bit out to me, like I couldn't help but also just think of the kind of uh, the kind of just summoning and going into caves and summoning din jinns and spirits that even Khadija, Muhammad's first wife, was involved in um, as a priestess at that time. It's pretty much it's all, all kind of alluding to that same thing. And, and you can see remnants of that belief, if not that belief itself, heavily present there. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, someone says this pagan belief, Marcus Schmidt. Um, yeah, I'm really just touching on the pagan stuff. I want to do a, a series on the pagan beliefs at the time. I'm busy working on that. It'll take me a couple of months. I've got such a mountain to work through. But yeah, it's it's incredibly interesting. And it explains the, the Islamic culture very well um, when we go into that, when I get to go into that. Thank you very much. No, it was definitely is a bank of information. Thank you. Right. And thank you, Sheikh Boyadi, for your super chat. Thank you very, very much. And welcome. I hope you enjoy this. Great stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Sheikh. <laughs> right. So now let's look at Abram and the pillars. Yahweh hates pillars. So the God of the Bible hates pillar worship. In Genesis, Abram and his descendants worship in a manner that includes mention of trees and pillars. Okay, this is in the re this reference is Israelite religions and archaeological and biblical survey. I usually don't include the references. Most mostly my references are here, in the bottom. You'll see in the notes section. I normally have references here because um, um, it's just easier. I don't always have space on the page to actually put all of my my references. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. 
yeah so i normally just put it there so it's not that i don't have them i just generally don't put them on the page because it takes up space because i'm trying to make the font as big as possible for people to read yeah no i i love that your your slides are so crystal clear i haven't even asked you to to zoom in once <laughs> yeah perfect. no thanks because man i i struggle man some guys put like regular size text they're like how am i supposed to see it on my cell phone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And even watching back as an experience for people, if it's full screen, it just flows so much better with text this size. But yes, thank you, Lloyd. No, thanks. Thanks, Sheikh Piyadi again. And I think you've got another fan, Nuria. <laughs> people are loving okay. this, but yes, carry on. Thank you. So notice in Deuteronomy 16 verses 21 to 22, I'm using the New King James Version, you shall not plant for yourself any tree as a wooden image near the altar which you build for yourself to the Lord your God. And 22, you shall not set up a sacred pillar which the Lord your God hates. A different variation says, do not set up holy stone pillars. The Lord your God hates them. How many pillars were in the Kaaba? Was it six? Originally six. There's now three. Yeah, yeah. And and okay. he was and Abraham was the first one to build it, apparently. So he must have built, built it with those pillars in. With pillars. Mm. Correct. Abraham supposedly built it. And Abraham was a worshiper of pillars. That is biblical. That's within the Bible. That's the context of the Bible. Abraham it's... was a pagan like his father. Yeah. And I mean, even now, just looking back at like modern or like Hajj in general, the pillar that either where you throw stones, you pelt stones at the pillar, which effectively represents the devil or Satan. It just shows that it's like the way it's been vilified here to try and make that separation, even though they don't understand that. You're either way, you're kind of stuck, literally stuck between a rock and a hard place, whichever way you're looking at it. Yeah. So, so let's continue. So notice this is in the book Genesis and Exodus, right? So if patriarchal religion corresponds to some kind of historical reality, then presumably this is either some form of a genuinely ancient pre-Yahwistic pre religion. Remember, Muhammad was looking for the religion of Abraham, the religion before Judaism. Right. And this is yes. what Islam alludes to. Right. This, So presumably this is some form of a genuinely ancient pre Yahweh religion. Mm -hmm. Right. Or it is something that was an unorthodox strand within Yahweh, within Yahwistic religion prior to the reforms of Josiah, a king in the Bible, Jewish king. So the difficulty with the latter suggestion is precisely the complete lack of that holiness and exclusiveness, which is one of the most fundamental characteristics of Yahwism. So you had all this polytheistic paganism going on. And then Abraham, he meets the one true God. And the one true God says to him, you will have no other gods before me. I am the true God. I am El. No one else bears my name, right? He's then told and his descendants are told to destroy the altars, destroy the pagan some idols, right? So that's just something. So they're saying, look, then maybe there was some kind, maybe there was some kind of genuinely ancient pre yahwistic religion. Mm-hmm. Right? So there, there seems to have been one because if it's an unorthodox strand within, then it says like, well, it, it, you know, at least according to this scholar, he doesn't think there was, there could have been a heresy or there could well have been one. Yeah. We know for a fact there were heresies, but that's just, just a point to make. So now I'm going to go to, um, I'm not going to belabor this point or spend too much time, but I want to go sure. to a place called Gebekli Tepe, right? Okay. In Turkey, and, modern day Turkey, right? Yeah. Correct. In, in a place called San Lirfa. So according to some Jewish, and notice San Lefa is about 12 kilometers, if I recall, from Haran, or 30 kilometers from Haran, where Abraham lived. And Abraham's brother is called Haran, named after the city. Okay. So according to some Jewish and Muslim sources, Edessa, or Urfa, is ur Kastim, the hometown of Abraham. So I'm not going to get into a long, belabored point about this, but... Biblically, based on that evidence, scholars had always assumed that Ur, where Abraham was from, was in the north, right, around Haran. Then in 1938, you had a guy with a lot of money, great PR skills, found this huge ziggurat in southern Mesopotamia. And he says, this city is worthy of Abraham and blah, blah, blah. And suddenly, because this guy had such a big, you know, was so popular, so well-funded, he was able to then convince everyone that, that Ur is to the south. However, if you look in history, there's at least five Urs up north alone mm. right so according to the sources that i've read the the conclusion i've come to is that ur was to the north 
but that's a very long discussion outside of the scope of this. So sure. one scholar called Rensberg points out that this location makes better sense of the biblical references. This was always the view prior to 1938. So if Terah, the name of the father of Abraham, and th these will be very important soon, and his family, they left ur -Kasdim to travel to Canaan, but they stopped en route in Aran, then ur -Kasdim should be north of Haran. Okay? In other words, if Haran is here, okay, this is San Lerfa, this is Haran, this is Haran here, okay? So if they yeah. stopped, then they would go to Canaan right here. They would go to Israel right here. Now, we'll, we'll get to this. So we'll cover this again in more detail shortly. Now, okay. so 12 kilometers northeast of San Lerfa, very close to Haran, where, where Abraham spent a large part of his life, is the famous Neolithic Gobekli Tepe, the world's oldest known temple from roughly 10,000 BC. It's now been discovered there's one even older than Gobekli Tepe. There's one that's two to 3,000 years older than it, which is crazy oh, stuff. Yeah, so this area, we're talking very old now. Extremely, yeah. So this area was part of a network of the first human settlements where the agricultural revolution took place. Interestingly, the, the Nabataeans, the, sorry, not the Nabataeans, the Yemenis, the Sabaeans, the, their history was in a book on agriculture. True, yeah, as we saw earlier. And because of its association with Jewish, Christian, and Islamic history and the legend according, according to which it was the hometown of Abraham, Urfa is nicknamed the city of prophets. Mm. Haran is named the city of the moon. Interesting. Okay. Yep. We're going to cover all of that now. So in the time available to us. So uh, is it in Iraq or Turkey? As I said, according to the sources that I've read, I lean in the direction of the north. Okay. Okay. So there was more than one Ur. Places named Ur was something linguistically close to be a candidate, okay, such as Ura, for instance, have turned up in numerous ancient inscriptions at Ugarit on the Mediterranean coast in Syria, at okay. Nuzi in northeastern Iraq, Alalak in Turkey, about 100 miles north of Ugarit, and most recently, something like two or 3,000, or as many as 5,000, can't remember exactly, tablets were found, inscribed tablets were found in Ebla in northern Syria. So there's a... Okay. a very, not all of those have been translated yet, so they're still working on it. It's going to take years. The Ebla tablets include references to places called Ur, Ura, and Urao, all in the north, all in right. Syria, Turkey. Unfortunately, none of these references can be located precisely, but the fine spots where they were found indicate the cities were most likely in central or northern Syria or southern Turkey, near Haran. This is here. Turkey in Haran. So I'll move back out. This area up here, this is Jerusalem, that's Haran. This is where Ur is supposed to be, the great ziggurat, which is far, right. far away from everything. Yeah. Okay. So I'll continue. Now, okay. Haran is where Abraham... I Did don't you, know... You... Uh, this is outside of the scope because I, I'm talking about the origins. Of... Now, look, everyone wants one single origin of Islam. Islam started on Tuesday, the 4th of April, <laughs> 6, 32 in at 12 Mill Street in Mecca. Okay. And it was a bunch of three guys. One of them was Bigfoot. One of them was the representative of the Illuminati. And one was a gray alien. And they made it up. I mean, the, everyone wants a nice pat answer. It happened. Bang. <clears throat> Islam took hundreds of years to develop. Even it's mm -hmm. even the Sharia took hundreds of years. The Quran seems to have taken two hundred years to write. <clears throat> and I think that's actually what what you're unpacking here in this present because we're literally seeing that this evolution and we're seeing the different layers added on and we're seeing the offshoots and this is all like just the different components of what we see. Albeit we're saying like it could be Sabaean, like you know, in very close form today, but we are seeing all these like geographical influences, the name changing. What are that? Are you having a chat? Is very car? funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, April Fools. <laughs> I mean, uh, I do think it is one of the biggest cons in human history. So by that standard, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so Haran is where Abram, okay, as he was yeah. called then, went with his father, Terah, after they left Ur. So there is no dispute regarding the location of Haran. And right. Michael Fowler, you may be right. I mean, we may be right. So the Turkish government has denied any excavation in Haran. Okay? okay, it's not allowed. Oddly enough, the Saudi Arabian government doesn't allow excavation in Mecca. Yep. You know, that's <laughs> the wonder. <clears throat> wow. 
indeed that is interesting that is very interesting i need to look into that thank you for for bringing that up i did mention rock carvings or rather an inscription by abraha who supposedly took the elephants to mecca uh in yemen where he mentions that muhammad where he mentions muhammad in reference to jesus and he mentions the very first name of of allah in the quran which is um uh which is what was the first rahman? name of allah in the quran rahman, rahman in yeah. reference to god yeah so the, the 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 carvings, the inscriptions do do say that. So Southern Ur, so just very briefly to run through this, okay? This is not this is not the point of it, just something interesting. Southern Ur lies on the west bank of the Euphrates. When Abraham was an old man, he sent his servant back to the land of my birth, Ur to find a wife for his son Isaac. So Abraham's servant went back to the land of Abraham's birth, found Rebekah, and so on. A generation later, Isaac's son Jacob goes back, presumably to Ur, to work for Laban. After working, he then fled flees to Canaan. But they say to do so, he had to cross the Euphrates in Genesis 31, 21. So if Ur is on the west bank of the Euphrates, as southern Ur is, it would not be necessary to cross the Euphrates to travel to Canaan. Right. right? Okay. So the southern Ur, thus, according to this logic, look, there's a lot more. I mean, man, there's old books on this, right? But the southern Ur, thus, cannot be the place that Abraham sent his servants. So he had, it had to be Haran. That's what they're saying, right? Mm. So let's have a look. Gobekli Tepe is not... A single temple, it's a network of temples. Here's a handful, I think it's 13 on this page. So this is Gobekli Tepe. This is Haran down here. The city of Haran is just here at the bottom. Notice they are numerous. This is San Lufa, okay, more or less. Now, notice there are numerous Tepes. There's not just Gobekli Tepe, there's numerous Tepes. Let's have, a, let's have another look. This is a map from the team. This is 19 different Tepes. Wow. And apparently there are dozens According mm -hmm. according to one, one of them said on the note, they said there are dozens. These are the ones that they've released the locations of where they're making digs. So these are so Gobekli Tepe was a network. Now understand Gobekli Tepe is not even the oldest. I believe they state here that I think if not Sefer Tepe, I, I'm not sure it's one of or Karahan Tepe, one of these is mm -hmm. actually older than Gobekli Tepe by a couple of thousand years. Okay. So, and you're now, saying that not, this is not even an exhaustive uh a, the, no, yeah, it's not a picture it's not. we have of all the tepes. Okay. Yeah, apparently there's dozens. Um, so this is just 19 of them, but apparently there are dozens. That, that I don't have a figure, but the, the, sure. the team apparently says there are dozens. Mm. Now, understand, I'm not stating that this is the religion of Abraham, but so what I'm getting at is that these people of that time must have been aware there was a very old religion, the original religion. This is the oldest network of temples in history. Nothing is older than this. So with 19 of these that are known of today, at least that we have access to, with dozens apparently in the area, they must have been aware they were the remnants of an old religion and they wanted to find the original religion. Abraham happened to be hanging around right here. Abraham, yeah. this is where Abraham lived for a long time. His brother is named, his grandfather, his great-grandfather named after towns in the area. So he's closely associated. So they might have thought, well, Abraham was here, the original religion was here, the Muslims might have made the connection and said, okay, that's the religion of Abraham and it's the worship of stone pillars. Yeah, that sounds incredibly plausible to me. Yeah, so we'll continue. Thanks. So let's have a look at a 9,000 year old shrine in Jordan, what we would call a Silim. Okay, remember okay. Silim? Very interesting, yes. Oh, the root. Guys, remember do the, you remember that from last week? Yeah, exactly. Yes. This, this is the root derivation. So... Muslims always tell you Sillam means, you know, Islam, right? Which means, they'll tell you it means peace, but we know it's not peace. It means submission. Yeah. Submission to God, okay? But, so so we have Sillam, okay, fine and well. Then we also have Sillam, which is the, the root of Shalom and the root of Salam. Yeah. Okay? Now, of course, what Muslims don't tell you is that originally, so these are the, the very first use of Sillam, Oops, in my typing, I spell very well, but I type really badly. <laughs> was the moon was the star god Shalim? Okay, the very first use was it was the pagan star god Shalim. The second use okay. of Salim in history basically is the word graven idol. Yeah. Okay, a graven idol. So now, again, notice, sorry, Lloyd, from... just from the top, Shalim is pagan. The god, star god, star god. We'll come to him later, yeah. Then we've got graven idol, 
And look, number four is what we think we are today. But look what's happened before that. Yeah. So, so this is what we have. So understand. So now let's look at these graven idols. Notice the graven idols and the stone pillars. Oh, yeah. Now, this is Damascus up here. Haran is a little bit north. This is Petra. Okay. Abraham eventually settled down here. Okay, Abraham eventually should Abraham died close to here. Okay, and this is very close to Petra. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Right. And don't forget also that just up here, remember we had those stone pillars in Arabia. I showed you there are 50 stone pillars arranged in circles in Arabia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those stone pillars, there's 50 of them. Now, Gobekli Tepe, just that alone is a network of 19 temples, circular temples. Gobekli Tepe is not one site, it's 19 sites. And I don't mean 19 spread across the country. I mean, Gobekli Tepe itself is 19 locations in the immediate vicinity. Okay, I mean, and are they? Are you talking about like circular, uh, like structures yeah. within a circular structure then? Um, so thing? Gobekli Tepe would be like 19 circular structures in the close proximity of each other. Right, okay. Right, and remember I showed you there's 19 of these temples all around, at least that we know of, all around Turkey. Right, mm -hmm. just in that area. That's 19 separate locations. Yeah. Okay. But Gobekli Tepe, where Gobekli Tepe itself is, there's 19 or 20 of these temples. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. In the immediate yeah. vicinity. Right. And it, so here in here in Saudi Arabia, you've got these little stone circles, these megalithic mm -hmm. stone circles. Here you've got this megalithic temple with stone pillars and graven idols. And then you've got Petra right next to it. So this is called Jalal Akasabia. Okay, the French and Jordanian archaeologists made this very unique discovery, nine thousand years old. Thanks, Marcus. Okay, and this sheds new life on the prehistoric religion in the Levant. They have graven idols and pillar statues from the Neolithic, and yeah. this is exactly what in Genesis God says to to Abraham: No worship of pillars, no graven idols. Thou shalt not bow down to graven idols. Thou shalt, you know, ten commandments. Yeah, precisely. So, there's, so, so now let's continue. So, yeah, any comments on that before I move on? Uh, no, I think it's really interesting. This whole uh, kind of pillar worship is is coming like full circle. And you see that just with the derivation that you've showed us as well and where that root word came from, literally meaning graven idols at one point, it's just, it's bec becoming a lot clearer, like what's happening here. Oh, so if so this is the original religion of Abraham, which they might have thought was the original religion of Abraham, then they had graven idols and stone pillars. And then obviously Abraham was a pillar worshiper, a pagan. So Islam decided Abraham worshiped paganism. Well, hey, we're pagans today. Yeah, exactly. And uh, by and for that, we're all, we all fit into that Hanifa uh, kind of mold and we'll take that on. Sorry, so, sorry, I sorry. missed that. I was reading something. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's uh, oh, fine. Are you this. reading this? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So just uh, to just before we move on to Abraham a bit more, secular rarity saying, wow, all of these connections are just super cool. And really, when you step back from the view that Islam has to be the perfect word of Allah, it becomes much more interesting and way less harmful. Exactly, exactly. Um, and that was honestly the the motive for me to to have like bring Lloyd on and do this because uh like being a believing Muslim at one point and thinking that the Quran was like the sanctimonious, eternal, timeless word of God. And now looking at it historically, archaeologically, just delving into the history, you're like, what? It's so interesting how it came together. But what we are taught, like what package we're sold it in and, and what we're told to believe. And if you strip it back, it's insane, the findings. Um, but also, I just think it's testimony to, to how Lloyd has put this together and how he's walking us through this picture. I feel like I'm, I'm going, I've gone back in time and we're tracing this all the way back. So, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. So no back to Abraham was a very key figure here. Now, I'm going to jump to the end for a minute, just so that everyone knows what the conclusion is. <laughs> OK, spoiler warning. So um, what was the point I'm going to make here? Abraham is the patriarch of the Jews, right? I mean, obviously, he's one of the many patriarchs, but effectively, Abraham, father Abraham, father of the nation. We'll get into all that, right? But the, the conclusion here is that, obviously, then Christians revere Abraham because they're part of the line of Judaism. Obviously, there's still a split. Orthodox Jews don't like the Christians because they think the heretics are fine and well, right? I mean, all those issues aside, you've still got, and the, the Old Testament is a testament to the coming of Jesus and all of that. I mean, that's all the theological debate and discussion. But you've got Christians, you've got Jews, you've got Abraham. Abraham, 
gives you the Jews, Jews gives you the Christians, fine and well. Yeah. Then you have the Muslims, they claim to be part of the religion of Abraham. They claim to be an Abrahamic religion. Of course, they are not because, you see, it was only, and I'll get to this later within this presentation, but only after the Jews told Muhammad, you're talking nonsense, go away. Only when they rejected him thoroughly, they completely laughed at him. Then, only then in the Islamic record, did he suddenly turn around and say, oh, by the way, Abraham was a Muslim too. And I'm and I'm from the lineage through Ishmael. He clung on to that. Yeah, but Abraham was never originally part of what Muhammad was saying. Abraham, <laughs> yes, he I see. What you added mean. Abraham only when the Jews told him to get lost. I then see. Said, so was that him? Do you reckon trying to legitimize his yes, position? Correct. Then, yeah, that's exactly okay. what he was trying to do. He wanted to legitimize it because they said, you're clearly plagiarizing from things that came before. This is mentioned in the Quran. So, so let me talk briefly about Abraham. And uh, so in Jewish tradition, uh, do you have any questions? Sorry, before I go on. Uh, no, sorry. I was just reading some of the, the comments. <laughs> um, right. So <clears throat> re rejection, reaction. Yeah. In a way, this is what, what, what uh, Lloyd was just alluding to. He, he didn't care to establish this connection with Abraham until the Jews actually told him to get lost. And then he's like, hold on, let me come and attach myself to who you revere and legitimize, is well, what was proto-Islam <laughs> at that point. Right. So Abraham was born under the name Abram in the city of Ur in Babylonia in the year 1948 from creation, roughly 1800 BC. Look, the dates vary. Okay. Right. Um, so he was the son of Terah, or Terah, an idol merchant. But from his childhood, he questioned the faith of his father and he sought the truth. So he comes to believe that the entire universe was the work of a single creator. And he teaches this belief to others. He tries to convince his father of the folly of idol worship. And one day his father leaves the shop. Abraham is left alone, takes a hammer, smashes all the idols except the largest one. Puts the hammer in the hand of the biggest one. His father comes back, says, what happened? He says, well, the big idol smashed all the little idols. His father says, don't be ridiculous. These idols have no life. And he says, well, then why do you worship them? So eventually, this one true creator that Abraham worship calls to him and makes him an offer. If Abraham leaves his home and family, God would make him a great nation and bless him. So Abraham accepts this offer and the covenant, the Brit, between God and the Jewish people is now established. So Abraham now founds the Jewish people, the Hebrews, right? That's right. in Genesis 12. The idea of Brit or covenant, okay, is fundamental to traditional Judaism. So we have a covenant, a contract with God. Now understand when you become a Muslim and you say the Shahada, it's a contract. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, it essentially, is a contract, yeah. Right? Understand it's a, it's a contract, <clears throat> but also... Unfortunately, you get different kinds of contracts. You you might have a contract of marriage, which is a very, um, uh, if you look from a Christian point of view, a marriage contract is something that is very holy, sacred. Okay, it's whereas if you look at Islam, a marriage contract is simply a contract that you will, well, it's yeah, it's a contract to have sex. A, yeah, exactly. To have legal intercourse, it's really just a contract of legal intercourse without having your head chopped off. Precisely, right? even really the word for it, the nkh root in Arabic for nikah, nuk. The NK it means intercourse. Yeah. Well, so there yeah. you go. So, um, discussion <laughs> but also, for another time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Lloyd, just real quick as well, when you uh, were just in the previous slide, when you were talking about that Jewish um, tradition of Abraham, the smashing the idols, um, uh, this entire story is literally almost again like the way that Muhammad's beginnings of destroying the idols in the Kaaba is kind of portrayed to us in this way that he was turning away from the religion of his forefathers. This exact, these, these lines I've heard people put into the mouth of Muhammad and saying, these idols have no life. They can't do anything. Why worship them? Even in the propaganda type um, Muslim Islamic films, like even in the message, you, this scene is like portrayed as one of the the most profound scenes for for the beginnings of Islam, when Muhammad walks into the Kaaba, literally destroys all the idols. I think there were 360 idols in the Kaaba at that moment. And yep. it, it's pretty much that, that I could not help but think of that story almost verbatim. It's clearly plagiarized from that. Yeah. Let's have a look at that story in the Sira. Okay, this is the mm -hmm. life of Muhammad the Prophet by Sayyid, Sayyid, Sayyid. Good grief, what is Sayyid? <laughs> Sayyid, Sayyid, Sayyid. Sayyid. <laughs> This means he's uh, he's born in the lineage of the prophet. Of the prophet, uh, yeah, lineage. three times over. <laughs> three times, exactly. You have to rub it in. So, mm -hmm. Abdullah ibn Masud says, entering the Mashud, Mashid al-Haram, entering Mecca's 
Okay. Entering the Kaaba, the holy prophet started breaking and de demolishing the idols. There were 360 idols, okay, affixed on the walls and on the roof of the Kaaba with lead or tin. Any idol near which the prophet went and towards which he pointed his cane, that's mm -hmm. Muhammad. This is a real picture I took from the... I was going to say Harry the... Potter in the making where Voldemort is way more representative. So Muhammad would walk towards the idol and he would point his cane. He would say, right has come and falsehood has vanished. Falsehood is destined to vanish. The idol would fall headlong on the ground without anyone touching it. He wouldn't even need to touch it. He cast a spell from his Sorry. wand and gone. Yeah, Muhammad's that good. <laughs> So this is in the this is in the Gospels of Muhammad. Yeah. This and is the Sira. So this is this is uh, literally the Sira itself. Yeah, this is the Sira. Yeah. So there's that story, and you, I mean, you you can just see they they've they've embellished some details there, but it's pretty much a plagiarized story. Yeah. Even so embellishment is not only legal; it is considered recommended in Islam. It falls under what's called the ilm al-badi. The ilm al-badi, you know, the Islamic sciences, which are not sciences. So the ilm al-badi is the Islamic science of speech, but it's the science of rhetorical speech. But this is speech that includes embellishment, mm -hmm. artifice, and there's a third one. Artifice is basically lying to make things up, and embellishment is exaggeration. Okay. Momo magic, yeah, yeah, for, <laughs> for definite, right? So I'm just... So what you have is, so yes, within the Islamic sciences, you're expected to embellish and use artifice. Artifice is to lie, to deceive. This is, this is, a, this is a proper usage of Islamic science. Wow, lying to deceive. And, and so you're saying, so embellishments are, so with that point, are you trying to say, for example, it's encouraged to add more fluff to a story to give your idea and your like ancestry to make more... it more beautiful yes, yes yeah exactly and and more legitimacy and more kind of powerful over the others and so you have the claim to lord like the lord over others so that's all also part of the islamic doctrine of the islamic doctrine is that what you're saying um yes it is wow okay so jazz it up as much as you need to to sell this that is legal um okay ilm al -Badi. Uh, the branch of the rhetorical science, notice rhetoric is not a science. Okay. Rhetoric is yeah. speech to persuade. Yeah. Which true. deals with the beauty. So just read that. Uh, you, you read that. <laughs> Ilm al Badi, the branch of rhetor rhetorical science, which deals with the beautification of literary style, the artifices of the or ornamentation, and the embellishment of speech. Holy crap. It is there in writing. Okay, no wonder this they haven't this. held back with the like fantastical claims and the language and details which really make you, you know, think twice and thrice about a story. Obviously not not as a believing Muslim, you take it at face value, but yeah. That's okay. why yeah, some of those brief... ridiculous details have made it in. Okay, let's look at the briefly, just the meaning of artifice without going into this. A clever trick or device, a clever strategy intended to deceive or defraud. Mm. That's an artifice. That's what they mean. If you false or Lloyd, behavior, what you're right? also showing us, Lloyd, is literally like falsehood and deception and fraudulent behavior is literally seeped into the very notions of Islam as an ideology. I mean, it's almost Correct. built on like like fake it till you make it kind of thing, and don't Correct. let anybody know. It's so twisted, like from the very beginnings, from its foundations. Yeah, it's yes, that is true. That, that's I, it, Marcus. That. <laughs> the art of spinning yeah. a yarn. So understand, Islam is built on this deception. This is it's it is recommended that you do this, and mm -hmm. that is true. So let me continue here. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> okay, so Abraham. Right, so let me see. Yeah, any questions about what we've just discussed about this ilm al badi? Uh, not from me. I am. I am very much with you on that. I'm just a bit shaken up. <laughs> but I guess let's move forward. Yeah. So ilm al badi is the science, right? And then under the umbrella of this science, you have other sciences and you have other doctrines or practices, right? So one of those doctrines you have the ilm al badi, the science of rhetoric, which is persuasion. 
But for okay, so ilm al is the science of rhetoric and persuasion. Now you know you've got the schools of fiqh, right? Yes. They say the schools of fiqh. Those are schools of jurisprudence. You'll yes. often say you have the madhabs. Okay. Yeah. You'll often say people will use fiqh and madhab interchangeably. Fiqh mm -hmm. means jurisprudence. Madhab does not mean jurisprudence. It means persuasion. Right. They are schools yeah. of persuasion. Mm -hmm. Madhab wow. is a school okay. of persuasion. It's the one who is the most eloquent, the most persuasive. So even the madhabs are competing amongst each other in a way to be the most persuasive? Is that what's happening here? Before that made it, they were. Yeah, okay. So they, yeah, right. And then, they, but they still managed to hold off and, and maintain the discrepancies within those four, yeah? There wasn't like... The discrepancies are considered a mercy from Allah because, for instance, <laughs> what if you're born with one leg? You can't run as fast. You can't worship Allah as well for argument's sake. So mm -hmm. what happens is that's why you've got Rukhsa and Azima. You have strict observance. If you're a strong guy and you're very good, you can you can worship Allah fully, completely, without error. You can follow all the rules. But if you if you if you aren't competent in that nature, you've got some kind of lack, some, you know, one leg, no arms, then you know, then what happens is that the differences called the ikhtilaf, the differences allow you to to violate these rules, not follow them, but still earn reward and still follow Islam to the letter. You're just following right. Rukhsa. So in other words, if 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 Azima says stab people in the eye on London Bridge and Rukhsa says lie to people, you both earn reward. The other guy just gets more reward. I see. Okay. Right. Is that because... Okay. No, that makes sense. Um, Michael Fowler says... I think this is a huge compliment that where he says, um, David Wood is missing so much by not watching this. Um, I feel like, yeah, if... Um, Lloyd could share this information on some level like that. And there's a kind of collab there. I think you guys would would really be taking Islam down. Yeah, sorry. Let's carry on, Yeah, you're welcome. No, thanks. Yeah, so so hopefully this is... Uh, but any comments before I go on? Anything you want to add? Um, no, to be honest. I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get my head around, uh, as you're saying, like how deep and how at the... Like, I thought deception came into it, you know, later on in the game or whatever. But if you're telling me that this is built into its very foundations now... It's fundamental. It's, it's fundamental. Mandatory. And it makes sense. It makes sense when you think about when you're talking about lawful and not lawful, that that's how Islam is set up. And then you're bringing in the madhabs. And it's just starting to make a lot more sense. But also... I'm just a bit shaken up by it. it is so dark at its very, very core that for people to go and, and claim and think and be duped into this being a spiritual, you know, uh, a, a way to live your life in a spiritual way or or be the best version of yourself. How could you ever be the best version of yourself and and, you know, be just just live life to the like even even morally when this whole thing is set up on deceiving embellishing uh, in deceiving with intent as you said that is a crime in, in in 2022 in the west that's a crime yet this is what islam is built on it's uh it's uh, as as um josie wales is saying it's really opening my eyes and and it is a wonderful thing yeah uh, even leaving islam and, and finding out like the levels to which lloyd has gone and he like even in our chats off air, he was telling me like Islam is truly, truly dangerous. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I completely hear that. But the extent to which it was dangerous in its very foundations, I did not know. Um, so yeah, Allah knows best. Allah is the best deceiver, it turns out. But yeah, thank you. This is this is in, in, ex, insanely illuminating for me. But yeah, thank you. so we've got about 10 uh, minutes left uh, for today's session, Lloyd. So feel free to kind of like steer it and and leave off, close okay, off sure. wherever you like. Well, look, I enjoy the conversation and I, I want to be able to answer questions because um, I know I, I want to engage the audience as well and answer their questions. So I'm, I'm happy to go on a little bit further. Thank you, Free Somali sure. Minds. Uh, yeah, we, so no, but thank you. I mean, you're a really good host. You ask really good questions and I, I like the it, you know, it, it also gets me thinking, you know, it also helps me to, uh, to not just read, <laughs> you know, like a lecture. Um, yeah, I'm I want glad. To I mean, some... I, I wish I could keep up with you historically, but honestly, this is just purely, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of this for the first time and I'm just like, wow, I cannot be like more grateful that I've left. <laughs> you know, so, so for instance, okay, this is very mild so far, but this is the laws on marriage. Okay. Okay. So. So whether prepubescent or not, this girl must be married. Okay? This is in the Islamic law. So I'm going to go through just a handful sure. just to a guardian may not marry his 
prepubescent son. Uh, sorry, he may not marry daughter his prepubescent, prepubescent daughter to someone for less than the amount typically received as marriage payment by similar brides, nor marry his prepubescent son to a female for less money than you would normally get. So understand, prepubescent marriage is legal in Islam, but let's continue. Definitely. Right? The Quran even sanctions it. Yeah. Okay. So they speak here of the divorce of a wife who is prepubescent. Okay. Mm -hmm. The divorce of a wife who is prepubescent. And now the 65-4 within the Quran, where they argue about whether this means, you know, a girl who's not had intercourse and all that, divorcing a wife, right? Mm -hmm. Just read this for me, please. Actually, just go down a little bit here. Uh, okay. Just, just read the second one, N9.2, if you would, please. A waiting period is obligatory for a woman divorced after intercourse, whether the husband and wife are prepubescent, have reached puberty, or one has and the other has not. Intercourse means copulation. This is also, guys and girls, whoever's not listening, this is exactly what um, Muhammad Hijab is referring to when he says that Quranists relying on the Quran alone, it encourages uh, mild pedophilia or extreme pedophilia, I think that was the word he used, because it's so, this is exactly what it says, you're able to divorce a prepubescent girl, meaning you're able to marry them. Um, and it states, no, there's no limits or age range in the Quran. It's only when you dive none. into, there exactly. There is none. There is none. There is no lower age limit to having sex with a girl in Islam. There is none. Yeah. So understand, so divorced after intercourse, whether they are prepubescent or not. You may have sex. Now, they speak of in another case, uh, actually, there's another case where the girl is accused of where a girl is accused of adultery okay mm -hmm. but she's a child in the cradle <clears throat> okay notice it says here if he or she is prepubescent at the time of marital intercourse they do speak of that uh sorry there was another i missed the other one but wow uh, that, that's actually issue. right yeah sorry this is i mean that th this this page and uh, by itself floyd is enough like you are literally talking about like raping a child here marrying off a minor having sex with a child you, you're told what the waiting period is i mean i don't understand how anybody can be privy to this information and still say things like this islam is the only true religion proud to be muslim are you really honestly like ali dawa proud of that that you can marry and rape a child in islam and they're telling you how to divorce them afterwards honestly yeah if you can I, I know we're slightly off topic but if you can read that for me this is from another very popular this book is still in use in pakistan within the court system this book is still in use today okay these books are still Bloody in hell. use if you can read that for me please sure when a man has had sexual intercourse with a girl under the age of nine years and has ruptured the parts it is unlawful for him to have further connection with her holy God. But she is not released from her ties if connected with him by marriage or slavery. If no rupture has taken place, the prohibition is not incurred according to the most valid opinion. If you Lord. don't destroy her vagina, they speak. I can go to another reference where you rip the skin between the bottom of the vagina and the anus and you rip that open. If that does not happen, you can continue having sex with this child. Oh my word, because, um, yeah, I was, I was going to mention something that that just reminded me of, but I completely forgot. I'm sorry. I, I just can't believe what I just read. I had never seen it. Sorry. Yeah. What I was going to say is this rupturing the parts. And, um, I think I was listening to a stream yesterday with Christian Prince and he was talking about in heaven, they actually go as far as in the Islamic heaven, heaven to describe, uh, the sound that will be made because these men will be like they'll have the power of like however many men and the whole point of these virgins or huris is that they 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 will constantly become virgins over and over again and the description in Islamic heaven of having intercourse with them is actually like onomatopoeia for a sound that will be heard because these men will be having sex with these women so loudly rupturing their vaginas and they'll constantly be made virgins again for these men so again just the darkness of this ideology is so obvious 
Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. The super awesome films is saying Lloyd, great work. And also there was a, a lovely comment here. And I think uh, super awesome films speaks for all of us. Oh, I can't find the comment, but super awesome films was saying us atheists are so happy to have you here, Lloyd. So we really do appreciate it. Yeah. No, look, this, as I said, the book that I just showed you no, is still is in use crazy. today in the Pakistani court system, for example. It is still a legally valid text today. Understand? This is what you're dealing yeah. with. Yeah. And so shall I just finish this section and then we'll we'll sure. call it? Let me just see where I am, if I may. Um, yeah, I'll probably just go a handful of slides further than if I, if I can. Um, I'm happy to go. Are you? Uh, do you want to end, or would you want you okay to go? A little uh, bit? I'm I'm happy to push it a little bit if you are. Yeah, sure. I'm okay. So you tell me. All right, I'll go for a little bit. You let me know. Uh, yeah, sure. We can we to... can go like 15 minutes over today if that works. If you're okay, I just want to finish that. But um, sure. hopefully the 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 hopefully this additional info I've shown you is helpful and illuminating. Most definitely. Most definitely. Thank you. Yeah, anyway, you can carry on loading so, whenever you're ready. Okay, so so covenants. The covenants is fundamental to the Old Testament. So in other words, Muslims will say, oh, but God said you must go kill that group over there called the McDonald's, okay? Well, the covenant within, within the Old Testament is, for instance, the McDonald's with diddling kids like we just showed. And God gave them 400 years to stop doing it, and they didn't. And God said, okay, well, look, you guys don't want to stop. I've sent you... Profit after profit, I've asked nicely. Let's slaughter the lot of you, right? This is disgusting. Personally, I I would I would nuke them from orbit if that was me, right? If people yeah. are doing that, I would nuke them from orbit. I wouldn't think twice. Yeah. Right. So, whereas if you look at the Sharia, it's for all time. It is for all time. A covenant within the Bible is for a specific time, place, and person. So it passes. These co there were many covenants, they are passed. The Sharia is the law for all time. There's a vast difference between those two. So the mm -hmm. old covenants are no longer holding true. Many old covenants are defunct, right? But that's a more complex story, but fine. So we have a covenant with God. It involves rights and obligations, okay? So Abraham was a city dweller, okay? And he adopted a nomadic lifestyle. Abraham is referred to as a Hebrew, the Ivri, okay? Possibly because he was descended from Eber or because he came from the other side of the Euphrates. So Abraham, Abram is exalted father. Mm. Abraham is the father of a multitude, father of nations. So he was concerned he had no children. So his wife, Sarai, who became Sarah, knew she was past childbearing years, and she offered her maidservant, Hagar, apparently an Egyptian pharaoh's daughter or an Egyptian princess, right, as a wife to him. So this was a common practice in the time. And according to tradition, Hagar was a daughter of Pharaoh, right, given to Abram during his travels in Egypt. She bore him a son, Ishmael who according to Muslim and Jewish traditions, the ancestor of the Arabs, fine. When Abraham was 100 and Sarah 90, God promises them a son and he has a son, okay? Isaac with Sarah, okay? In Hebrew, Yitzhak, a name derived from the word laughter, which is the joy of having a son. Isaac was the ancestor of the Jewish people and Abraham died at 175. So now, Sharia, the Islamic law, makes explicit claim that Islam is Gnostic. Gnosticism is not a form of religion. It is a form of revision. It is revision. It is an alternate interpretation of reality. So Islam is revisionist. It alters biblical figures and events that stem from earlier traditions. The sources of Islam, and we can go, I can do, man, the sources of Islam. 99% of Islam's tales can be sourced to earlier myths, Gnostic tales from other cultures. That's easy to True. do. That's really easy to do. Yeah. All the sources are Gnostically derived, 99% mm -hmm. of them, right? And they predate the Islamic stories by hundreds of years. So archaeological yeah. discoveries do validate the biblical narrative. This is not so with the Quran, right? Um, someone just asked me, that is Neil Bailey. Um, sorry, hold on. Someone just asked me this question about this book. Um, the source for this is an Islamic legal text. Oh, bugger. I'm just trying to find the question as well. Uh... Well, but now you sent it to me privately. The oh, Digest okay. of Muhammad in Law by Neil Bailey. Okay, now, so archaeological discoveries do validate the biblical narrative, okay? The Quran, there's no biblical historical, well, there's no historical validity to it. Archaeology plays no part in it. You cannot find any of these places, and they've concreted over all of Mecca, 
So there's no way to find anything. For instance, they claim that there's a 90 foot, 36 meter tall skeleton of Adam buried next to the Kaaba. Well, show it to me and we'll have to believe you, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, 300 prophets buried, perfectly preserved next to the Kaaba. Well, where are they? Abraham migrated from Mesopotamia to Haran, okay? Haran is the name of Abraham's brother. He then goes to Israel and in Babylon, they worship numerous gods. And in Haran, there was a moon god called Sin, among other names, also known as Al-Makkah. So this is the typical story. Although it seems that Abraham actually was born up here in Sandurfa, came down to Haran and then this way. I think this section is wrong, but that's fine. Okay, okay. that's the standard idea. So Abraham was 100 and he has his son, Isaac. Okay. So then you've got Ishmael and Ishmael mocks Isaac and Sarah doesn't like this. So she tells Abraham, take your, take your other wife, take you know Hagar and Ishmael, mm -hmm. send them away. I don't like them mocking my son. Okay. He's very unhappy about it, but God says, look, it's fine. Okay. Just let them go. That's fine. Okay. So because your, your tribe will be founded in Isaac, you'll be fine. So he takes bread and a bottle of water. He gives it to Hagar, puts it on her shoulder and the child, and he sends her away. And she wanders in the wilderness of Beersheba. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she wanders in the wilderness of Beersheba. Oops. So let's go to Israel. So this here is Israel and the I wilderness mean... of Beersheba. Lloyd, according to uh, the Muslim narrative, you should be taking me to like Safa Marva in Mecca right now, shouldn't you? I know. You? <laughs> this is Beersheba, right here yeah. in Israel. Okay, So she wanders there according to the biblical story. Now, so the water was spent, Okay, and she cast the child under one of the bushes in the shade, and she went and sat down, and she said, let me not see the death of my child, and she sat over against him and cried. And God heard his voice, and the angel of God called to Hagar and said, what aileth thee, blah, blah, blah. And she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave him drink. And God is with him and he grew and he dwelt in the wilderness, became an archer. Okay, blah, blah, blah. And then she took him a wife out of Egypt. Let's have a look. This is Beersheba here. This mm -hmm. is this part of Israel here. Jerusalem is just at the top of this. You can't see it, but Jerusalem is just up here. Okay. Yeah. So this is where she apparently wandered in this part of, according to the Bible. Now, according to Islam, they claim she wandered in Mecca. Now, we know for a fact that Abraham started off in Israel, right? So yeah. Muslims claim that she made a 1,200-kilometer trek over uncharted desert. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Unless she's flying on the Burak or something, I don't see that happening at all. Well, we're going to talk about the Burak in just a minute because <laughs> okay. Burak, unfortunately. So according to the Bible, she wandered between 43 and 70 kilometers. Okay, wow. biblically, yeah. if you work yeah. out, you would have wandered between 43 and 70 kilometers. I used Hebron because Hebron is where Abraham died. That's where he settled. Okay. okay? So Beersheba is about 40, 70 kilometers away, 43 miles. Okay, 43 kilometers or so, 27 to 43 miles. That's how far she, mar she marched. In Hagar's 1,200 kilometer walk in Islam, okay, the well is Zamzam in Mecca. So Hagar and the infant Ishmael traveled 1,200 kilometers with one bottle of water on foot across arid, uninhabited, unexplored, harsh desert a thousand years before it became a major trade route. Yeah, and it would have been uh, uh, in some of the terrain that we discussed last week in the Rub al Khali, like the empty quarter type, harsh desert. It's It, it's, it makes no sense. Yeah, with one alone, possible right? quarter. Yeah, exactly. So in the standard Islamic narrative, Abraham walks with them there. That's the first story. He walks them there, then leaves them under a tree with some dates, some Adra dates probably, and walks back to 1200 <laughs> Three, to be precise. <laughs> then walks them back. So Allah is forgetful. Hagar is never mentioned by name. He doesn't know her name. Paran, according to Islam, is the Hejaz. So she searches for water between Safa and Marwa. Muslims tell us that Ishmael's heel touched the ground and opened up a well of water. Muslims also tell us the angel's heel touched the ground and opened up a well of water. Muslims also tell us that the angel's wing dug up the well. Yeah. Very specifically. So in Quran 1437, we have our Lord. I've settled part of my descendants in a barren valley by your sacred house, the Kaaba, and that they may maintain the prayer. Okay, so that's where Abraham built this Kaaba. Mm. Fine and well. The problem is that this narrative is dated at the very earliest to 827 AD, 200 years after Muhammad died. <laughs> that's already i mean way 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 too late but also the story makes no sense in terms of the islamic narrative or geographical location and it's a complete um fabric a ripoff of the biblical story 
Also, I mean, going to do um, Umrah, like going to Mecca myself and like walking between these two mountains, it just, it's, you know, even today, like you can see parts of it and then parts they've like completely uh, like cornered off. And it just seemed like even as like an 11, 12 year old child, it just seemed really misleading to me like walking between that and thinking there would be nothing here at that time and these don't even look like Marwa. yeah 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 that's it and then in the middle there when you're doing um when you're doing the pilgrimage there's like green lights that they have where which indicates where you should run and like speed up your walk because that's exactly what Hagar did yeah fascinating yeah. Well, now you do it in air conditioning, I guess, so that's fine. You do, you do it in air conditioning, yeah. You can even be pushed on a wheelchair, if, even if you're tired. Yeah. So, so now you've got this story that was added to the Islamic narrative 200 years after Muhammad is supposed to have died. So this is obviously plagiarized and added in to give them legitimacy. Yeah. Right. So, for instance, let's look at this. Ancient towns in Saudi Arabia from Wikipedia or Wackypedia. Uh, as everyone can, as, as all my critics will say, Wikipedia is my first and only source. <laughs> <laughs> yes, guys, I'm using Wikipedia, so now you can call me a quack. So <laughs> this is a Wikipedia article called Ancient Towns in Saudi Arabia. It does not list Mecca, nor does it list Medina. It does list the ancient, okay? <laughs> it does list the ancient Yemeni pagan town. The, this is the, remember when the Kinda, the Yemenis, when they invaded Arabia, they controlled Arabia, this was their capital. Right, okay. This is listed as an ancient town, one of 13 ancient archaeological towns, okay, proven towns in Arabia. But Mecca, the mother of all cities, somehow doesn't make this list, nor does Medina. Yeah, Very unusual. Correct. Very unusual. Exactly. Yeah. So Hagar walks 1,200 kilometers. So guys, we'll wind up in a moment. So Hagar walks 1,200 kilometers then to Egypt to get Ishmael a wife afterwards. Okay, so he grows up, he walks 1,200. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Ishmael, so Isaac and, his, and Ishmael buried him. So they buried, so Abraham dies, they bury him, okay, in Hebron, right? And of course, how does Ishmael get to the funeral? Okay, so when Abraham died in Hebron, Ishmael walked 1,200 k's for the funeral and back, presumably 1,000 years, okay, before the caravan route. Ibn mm -hmm. Kathir says, no, 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 no. Abraham often rode upon the Burak to Mecca, yeah. coming suddenly to his son and then returning. God knows best. Well, um, like I was honestly, Lloyd, thinking, how is the only way, according to Islamic minds, would you make sense of this distance at that time? And it would be the Barak. That is the best yeah. concept to lean on to make to make that claim even remotely plausible. Just stick the Barak in there and say he flew on that winged horse, come woman, come mule, come elephant, come. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. So so let me just finish it. I'm, so Allah knows best, okay? I'm just going to quickly yeah. go to this. This is the Akida. Now I'm using the Akida al Tahawiya. Fine and well, okay? But um, so I just want to show you, just like in Christianity, you've got the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. In Islam, you also have a creed, the Akida, which defines all of the statements of belief in Islam. Notice this one over here. Does this look familiar to you? We say Allah knows best regarding matters, the knowledge of which is unclear to us. This is yeah. part of the Islamic creed. Yeah. The Lord knows best, right? Yeah. This is actually the creed of Islam. This is actually baked in. This is one of your fundamental beliefs as a Muslim. Wh you must accept where is this, this from again, Lloyd? What's the, what, where, which source? This specific one is the Akida al Tahawiya. Okay. The creed of Imam okay. al You get different okay, one. You get well. the Akira of the Ashari and so on. But uh, this one is, uh, I've used this one. There, yeah. Okay, brilliant. But yes. this statement is baked into Islam. If you don't know, Allah knows best. Allah knows when best. When you're clueless, Allah knows best. When you're ignorant, Allah knows best. That's so also even, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hmm? That, I was going to say that's also uh, slapped in at, at any point that it, it, Islam has like these metaphysical existential questions as well. Like the Quran specifically says, like, don't ponder on, on matters of the soul. Allah knows best. And actually says like you as humans just are not, you don't have the capacity to comprehend that basically. But yeah. That's because it, it is illegal yeah. for a Muslim to engage in philosophy. It is unlawful. Unlawful knowledge includes in the Sharia learning sorcery and philosophy mm. 
and magic and astrology. Notice philosophy is lumped in with magic, astrology, and sorcery. Yeah, because I mean, I can see where you'd get magic and sorcery in terms of like the seven deadly sins even, right? And how that could come through. But to lump in philosophy with that, because the second you start philosophizing, Allah, the Islamic Allah, falls to shreds. That's why they say don't even think too much in Islam, because as soon as you start critically thinking, you realize that Allah does not hold up once you ask those critical questions. Correct. That's... It falls apart. And unfortunately, look, there's more to it than that. There's also the moral rules which are aligned with this. That's a different section within this book, but mm. it explains it. So so there's, there's more to that. But I just wanted to give you a brief indication. So let me finish a couple of slides. We call it a night. Thank you very sure. much for your time. If you need to go, you let me know. We can always pick this up again. No, no, no. You, you round it up and then we'll, we'll bounce. No worries. Okay. So... So in, in, in Ibn Isaac's tradition about Abraham riding on the Burak to Mecca, where he visits Ishmael, this is found three times among the sources. So in other words, Ibn Isaac in the Sirah talks about Abraham using the Burak to fly from Hebron to Mecca. That's how he gets this 2,400 journey in one day. Okay. okay. 2,400 kilometers in one day. Abraham so, so, is a cut wait, Sorry, city. just for the Muslim what viewers out there, if, if there are any, we are saying now the Burak is Muhammad riding on the Mirage on the night of the mirage is not the first time the Barak has been used or mentioned Islamically, according to Ibn Ishaq. associated with Abraham. Okay, right. That's wild. Correct. So, so when Muhammad was given the Burak, so Gabriel brings him the Burak. So Muhammad gets on the Burak or tries to, and the Burak won't let him on his back. So the Burak starts bucking and refuses to behave. So Gabriel punches the Burak in the face yeah, and then it settles down, and Muhammad gets on his back. Yeah, exactly. Punches That's the rock in the face. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> There's the religion of peace just doing its thing again. So Abraham is accustomed to taking day trips to Mecca in order to check up on Hagar and his son. Day trips. That's how he does 2,400 kilometers in one day. This is the story they had to come up with to explain how Abraham was in Mecca, but also in Hebron. Yeah. Exactly. The only way you could think about connecting these two is by a, a magical claim like the Barak to yeah. make it make so, sense. Yeah. And then apparently it's not it's not Isaac that goes for the sacrifice. It's Ishmael. Here they claim that he came to pick him up for the sacrifice. Right. That was Ishmael, not Isaac. So it goes against the biblical narrative. Okay. This tradition provides no connection with the pilgrimage or building the Kaaba. So in the Sirah, there's no discussion of building the Kaaba nor the mm -hmm. pilgrimage just the sacrifice okay so they forget that part but somehow yeah. that doesn't exist in those records and now these records are 150 200 years after the death of muhammad and yeah. the earliest datable mention now notice this the earliest datable mention of the burak is by the poet a judge in a poem and he died in 715 again roughly 90 years after muhammad died mm -hmm. and he mentions it in connection with abraham it's okay a poem about abraham Okay, that's interesting because again, I'm like honestly, as a lay Muslim, I never knew of a connection between Abraham and the Barak. I exclusively thought the Barak was a, a one-time thing that night for the the mirage, which was also to like, you know, prove this. Uh, well, obviously, show Muhammad heaven and hell, but also prove that God is capable of all things. I had no idea that the Barak could be rented out <laughs> thousands of years before for Abraham to take day trips. Correct. But it's also really yep. interesting um, in where you said that the there's no um, connection of the building of the Kaaba because even in the Quran we see the verse where it just alludes to Abraham established a place of prayer or worship. And so we follow that example, but there's nothing beyond that said in that context. Yep. It's very, yeah. very vague. So they've taken, remember, the story of Abraham comes 200 years after Muhammad and this story, you know, these details on Abraham comes 200 years after the death of Mo. And then you've got this story of the Burak is associated with Abraham. And again, it's 750, in 715, which is well after the death it's of Mo. It's literally it's like using um, like filler, you know, to just, just whatever yeah. holes are there, just kind of like seal them over and, and, and shut them off. And it's by a poet. It's not by a <laughs> theologian. It's by a poet who was telling us a story. Mm, exactly. Once upon a time. There was a Burak. Uh, let's finish this one. So I'll finish this slide and done. So Mo sure. is having a read here on the Burak. Burak means lightning. 
So also called Alborak, Borak, many other names. It was a mule, elephant, angel, camel, woman, peacock horse. <laughs> that is great. Hold on, I just want to see the depiction for a second of yeah. It's and the face someone made of a, a very woman. funny comment here. It's like it could have made headlines. Sorry. Well, sorry, Lloyd. Wasn't it meant to be pure white, the Borak, or am I wrong? Because this depiction is a black horse. It's meant to be the perfect colors, the perfect oh, color. That okay. is because the star Sirius used to be the star of the perfect colors. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll get into all of that. Sure. But, um, what are you saying? Oh, man, there was someone who made a very funny comment. Like, this is like very funny. He said, it's like man punches horse in the face or man punches donkey in the face, creates new religion. <laughs> you know, it's like, how did this religion start? Well, you know, an angel punched the donkey in the face. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, so guys, I'll, I'll finish here. So, so this is a mule, elephant, camel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too funny. But. So, so the conveyance of Mo from Mecca to Al-Aqsa and to the skies is by means of the ladder. Okay, the Sulam. Notice SLM. You got again the Sulam. Oh, SLM, yes. SLM, the same yes, route. Yes. To the skies by means of Mo. He's also stated Sulem. in narration. Okay. And then sometimes in other narrations, he is on the wings of Gabriel. So there's a bit of a confusion there. Most of these narrations from Mo himself state he descended from Burak, okay, prayed in the mm. mosque, then went to the skies with Gabriel. Okay, Gabriel himself, maybe with two other angels, brought Burak on the night of Isra. When Mo mounted, it was disobedient, but Gabriel hit it in the face. So Burak will carry Because she had a woman's him. face, isn't it? That's why. <laughs> exactly. You punch the woman in the face. You know? Yeah. It's always so Burak violence. transports other prophets as well. Ibrahim, when he wanted to carry Hadron and Ismail to Mecca, she didn't walk. They went in the Burak. Somehow that story suddenly comes up, which contradicts the older stories where they walked. Okay, yeah. some narration said it was his conveyance on all his travel to Mecca. The descriptions are conflicting. Okay, so apparently when it went upwards, the hands became smaller than its feet, and when it came down, the feet got smaller than the hands. Uh, whatever. Just trying so to, ex to explain like propulsion and, <laughs> and descent, but it's like, why are you even trying? <laughs> so as the feet become smaller and the hands bigger, and vice versa, it keeps you on its back. Right. Fine. Okay. Great stuff. So it has a skin with the best color among all the animals. Its face was similar to humans and it could hear and understand like a human. So, okay. so that's the story. Um, shall I pause here and then we call it, we we can do another, we can schedule another story and I'll just leave it here and we'll explain more yeah, about the book. sure. Also, I do because see the reference here with a white skin, sorry. The Talmud. Sorry? Uh, I was just saying, I did, like, I saw the reference finally. I knew there was something, some of white obsession with it, with a white skin is somewhere here in the last, yeah, in the last like third line. It is described as a huge mount with furry. Uh, oh, and you sorry, can hear Duldul is Muhammad's white mule. So there's always a, a there a huge mount with furry mane and with a white skin. It has a skin with the best color amongst all the animals. Wow. What, so which it, one? It, white or the best color? Well, the huge mount with a furry mane and with a white skin. It has a skin with these. Yeah. So. I, I knew there was a reference somewhere. I knew they couldn't they couldn't just say the best of all colors without adding the word white in there somewhere. <laughs> I was just yeah. uh, making sure my my Islamic thing wasn't off. But yeah, sure. awesome. So if you want to go through the questions in the chat just to get those and then... Um... Sure. Um, yeah, thank you guys. We've got loads of funny comments coming through. I can't... Um... <laughs> I don't want to derail us too much because we will start just going into pure comedy. But um, yeah, definitely. Ray, when I first heard of the Barak, I definitely thought of Pegasus in my mind. Um, but yeah, okay, guys, I don't know. I haven't been keeping an eye on the chat, but if you have any questions, now is the time because then we will be wrapping it up very soon. We have gone a couple of minutes over, so I do appreciate Lloyd sticking around. Um, uh, Allied Atheist Alliance was asking you if you, your opinion on the Dan Gibson documentary suggesting Petra was the original Mecca, um, and it really ties into your theories in case you haven't seen it before, which I know you have. So, yeah, yeah your thoughts, Lloyd? If... I am familiar yeah. with it. I've watched all of his shows. I've watched all of his interviews. Um, I, there is relevance to Mecca. Um, the Like Alat Manat and Al-Uzza, the, the uh, three cranes, the... Um, from the satanic verses, Muhammad worshipped those gods. It's in the Islamic literature. We covered it last week. The Muhammad Haranik. actually had a son named after Al Uzza, right? Mm. He had a son named Abd Al Uzza, or the slave of Al Uzza. He and his wife Khadija worshipped Al Uzza. They prayed to them at night uh, before bedtime. But also, um, 
just like Petra fitted the theory because obviously it had rivers and waters and agriculture, but also dates and olives, um, Yemen fits that as well. Yemen also fits the template. And Yemen obviously has temples to Makkah, right? The earliest Qurans came from Yemen. The earliest Arabic script is Yemeni. The earliest Quranic script is Yemeni Arabic, right? And we've got all of these ties to Makkah, which is all Yemeni. Yemen fits the geography as well as Petra. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's why I think this information is just such a good, um, like it kind of paints that that full picture, whereas Petra makes a lot of sense and gives you like strong indications of what's happening. But if you build on that with this kind of this Yemeni side of things and that influence, then you really it makes sense in terms of Islam as a whole, where it's kind of getting its influences from and where it's kind of picking up momentum and steam. So I think the two theories, personally speaking, I think they work very, very well hand in hand, but that's just my opinion. Um, who painted this? This is clearly Haram. I thought the same thing, to be honest, when, when I see it or see descriptions, but even a uh, depiction, sorry, but even um, in Islamic art, it, there are books which show uh, the Prophet in various settings from like even the Mughal times in India. There's a couple of illustrations of the prophet. So for some purposes, it, it is allowed. I was more worried about the color of um, the Barak here because I always assumed it was it was talked about in this pure white thing that Islam has an obsession with. Um, that painting will be Eastern or Western. Yeah. Um, do you know the reference of this painting, Lloyd, by any chance? It's probably Persian. Okay. Um, yeah, most likely. I wasn't likely. thinking about it. It's probably Persian. It was very common up until I think even the 15th century for there to be paintings, pictures, drawings of Muhammad. Over time, though, he starts to wear a veil on his face and then eventually it gets banned. So adults, human, female, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank it's only you. much later in Islamic history that they ban images of Muhammad. Yeah, I, I agree. And then they switch to only calligraphy and like that kind of art because they deem it all haram. Uh, Josie Wales, again, is just saying, brilliant, Lloyd and Noria, entertaining and knowledgeable in parts, very horrible young girls. Yeah, exactly. Um, and to be honest, like, I pull out the dirt on Islam from the Quran and the Sunnah and, you know, bits of the Sirah, but where Lloyd is picking out this information on these exact rulings and rules for if you've ruptured their vaginas or not like this is a whole nother level of darkness being unearthed so i know we did veer off topic lloyd but i genuinely think you might have opened a lot of people's eyes with that and and that's not information a lot of us are privy to or even know what to search so thank you so much um i'm just gonna have a quick look if there's any other questions here this was a seriously interesting presentation. Thank you both so much. Yeah, thank you everyone who stuck around. Somebody did say they've never watched a full two hour presentation, but they refuse to go to bed because this is so interesting. So thank you. Um, so there's one question. I'm not sure if you can shed any light on this, Lloyd, and if you, if you can't, that's okay. Uh, what was the religion in Mecca before Islam? Did it have anything to do with Hinduism, which was a major pagan like religion in the region? Um, Do you have any thoughts on that? I will that? say from, okay, so the religion in Mecca was paganism. Um, you're looking at, there was, okay, so the Nabataean religion was in Mecca, which is the worship of Alat, Manat, and Al-Uzza. So the Nabataean religion was there. Those are those three gods. Um, Alat, sorry, no, Al-Uzza might be the female version of Hubal. There's a possibility that okay. Alat may be the female version of Hubal because the origin story of Alat arriving in Mecca and Hubal arriving in Mecca, both from Syria, are very similar. So there, there could be some confusion, but um, but they are pagan gods. These are the pagan gods of Nabatea. And then um, I, I will agree with you. Yes, the this if you look at Islam and Hinduism, they are very strong parallels. I have seen it. I just don't have the time. I don't have the bandwidth to get into that. But what I have seen does show me that yes, they do seem to be strong parallels. The the, the Yemenis who conquered that part of the of the world did extensive trade with India. The Ethiopians who conquered that part of the world and influenced it also did extensive trade with India. So those ideas, and we we did we provided the evidence to show that religion spread through mercantile networks through trade. So yes, they, they are definitely strong parallels. I just don't know very much about it, and I don't have the time to dig into it. I'm so busy with other things. Mm, yeah, well, thank you for that, Lloyd. Lloyd, guess who's here? Our very own... <laughs> Safraz Hussain, Hussain yeah. is here as well. Uh, he just couldn't stay away. 4,000 years ago. 
not even according to Muhammad is it 4,000 years ago, but we'll get into that. I mean, this yeah. guy is like, you know. Um, well, I just want to tell people who are watching, uh, because Lloyd definitely doesn't need to entertain this. They, they Lloyd and uh, Adam Seeker was took Safraz Hussain on a live show because apparently he's an expert on, what was it, Lloyd? He said the Old, the Old Testament. Testament. And, yeah. Well, he first challenged me on the Sharia, on Islamic law. He he said he wants to come up and debate me on Adam's channel on Sharia law. So we brought him on. And then he said, well, I don't know anything about Sharia law. Actually, I don't know anything. I'm an expert on the Old Testament. And he got smashed on the Old Testament as well. <laughs> yeah, he brought up the Gospels of Barnabas Look, I will say or something. Before, yeah. I will say it is illegal for Muslims to talk about the Sharia. It is absolutely, totally illegal. They cannot, absolutely, positively cannot reveal the Sharia to you. It's illegal. It's a secret. They cannot do it. There is no way he can do it. There's no Muslim who can come up and chat to them about Sharia law. It's not legal. So just, sorry, on to you again, thanks. No, but also, I, I don't even think, uh, Safraz Hussain, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't even think you know the, the what, what were we called, uh, Lloyd? The lowest level of us Muslims. I forgot the imp. Ibarra. 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 I don't Ibarra. think you Ibarra. even know Sharia according to, what, what's the death penalty for, what's the penalty for apostates, Safraz? Do you know what Sharia prescribes for them? Uh, because I've seen your posts and you live in a very woo-woo version of Islam that you've created for yourself, uh, which you think is all peace-loving. And even Lloyd has responded to you with hadiths that completely counter what you're saying in the comments. But thank you for stopping by anyway, Safraz. I hope you learned something today. Um, I'm unless taking it seriously. So my answers are, many of them are just very unserious. I'm like... Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, don't, don't, don't waste your breath, Lloyd. Um, Trevor Griffiths saying, Lloyd and Nuri, I hope you do more of these. Please don't stop. This is fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Um, if anyone has a question, you've got like 30 seconds, but otherwise I will let Lloyd go. We've taken a lot of his time. <laughs> Allied Atheist Alliance is saying Safraz really wants those 72 virgins. <laughs> uh, Safraz, I, you really don't want to stay in this cult even for a ward like that, no matter how nice that might sound. Uh, but yeah, basically, I think that's the problem. Islam is getting busted, and that's what's really, really irking you. But you're on the wrong channel. If you don't like what we're saying, just leave. <laughs> Thank you so much, Music Guy. Guys, I hope everything was okay in the chat today. Sorry I couldn't be on top of it the entire time. I'm also trying to absorb all the information that Lloyd is throwing our way because I want to be able to like pick up on things and have the you know just the lay woman's interpretation on it and ask those basic questions just so other Muslims who would have thought like me can also just you know connect the dots but yeah I think today we learned a lot I think this was an awesome part to Lloyd I think I think we're moving at a good pace what do you think uh yeah it's hopefully not too fast and everyone seems to be keeping up. So yeah, it looks fantastic. And thank you all for the positive comments and the support. And thank you for, for being here. And the questions, I really enjoyed the, the interaction and the questions. And thank you again, Nuria, you're a great host. No worries at all. Thank you. And hats off to my mods today. Um, if there was any issue with the chat, please just feel free to email me uh, separately. But I really appreciate that you guys understand that, you know, we're here to talk about a specific topic and conversation should remain on that topic. And no one's here to challenge anyone's personal worldviews that's off topic in this format. So yeah, I'm really grateful for that. And Lloyd, I hope you got a better reception this time and I hope it continues to be this way. So thank you so much guys, everyone for your love and for making Lloyd feel so welcome and uh, for really, really respecting his time, his work, his effort, his knowledge and for all your questions. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I guess until next time, uh, yeah, take it easy. Bye. Thank you, Lloyd, again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.